the land, the air, the water, and all that live on, in, above it. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet here. And we thank our, the generations of indigenous people who have taken care of this land and who continue to care for it. And we want to show our respect. And I think during a planning council, that's a good opportunity to show our respect as we will try to take care of some of the lands that we have responsibility for. Hundreds of years after the first treaties were signed, they remain relevant today. May they guide our decisions and our actions. We commit to learn, to educate, to honor sacred places, and to take action towards real truth and reconciliation. Megwitch. Make sure I get the, make sure I'm looking at the right agenda here. It's going to mess everything up. There we go. Council, any declarations of pecuniary interest? All right. Seeing none. Any, uh, anybody sign up for open forum, Ms. Madam Clerk? Oh, contrast to yesterday. Just saying. Um, all right. On the municipal public municipal act public meetings, we have an application to close a shore road allowance for 387 Berwick Road. This morning. Is that yours or? Oh, you want the speech. The speech comes first. I apologize. This morning, there's a public meeting scheduled for one shore road closing application. I will briefly summarize the procedure to be utilized for the meeting. First, the clerk will advise council as to when, how, and to whom notice of the public meeting was circulated for the proposed road, close, ro road closing being considered. Next, staff will advise of the purpose and effect of the bylaws and provide for any other information that is relevant to the applications, and staff will summarize any correspondence on file. From there, the public will have an opportunity to speak and provide comments to the bylaw being considered. Please be respectful of time and be concise with your comments. All commentators are requested to state their name and address. Council will then have an opportunity to provide comments for clarification. I now declare this meeting to be a public meeting pursuant to Missile Act 2001 C25 as amended to deal with the following proposed shore road closing bylaw. R23-05 for 385 Berwick Road. To our clerk. Notice that the public meeting was published in newspaper. It was not published in a newspaper, but it was sent <laughs> to the abutting neighbors in close proximity of the property at least 20 days prior to today's meeting. All right. And to our deputy clerk, I imagine. Good morning, Council. I'm just going to share my screen here. Right, so I'm just presenting Sherwood Allowance Application R23-0583. Um, 387 Berwick Road. Um, the application was received on November 20th, 2023. The, app the applicant is making the application to allow for future development. The Shore Road Allowance um, in front of uh, 387 for part one is 66.5 linear meters at a cost of 242 per linear meter for a purchase price of 16,000 um, and $93 plus HST. The property is zoned six mile lake um, residential, SR6, and there are no open building permits on file. We have a location map here of the subject lands. Um, I will note that the surrounding property is owned by the Crown and they had no objections to the projection lines. We also have an aerial image here as well as the survey. As you can see, some of their structures are located on part one of the Shore Road Allowance. Um, and I do believe that the applicant is present if you have any questions for myself or them. That's everything I have. Thank you very much. The applicant is present. I'm just pulling them over now. Oh, sorry? They're on Zoom. Okay, and does the applicant wish to make any comments with regards to this application?
Okay. Is there any members of the public who wish to speak to this matter? All right, council's turn. Are there any members of council who wish to speak to this matter? Councilor Jarvis. Just really quickly, Sydney, I, I, I understand that that's Crown Land immediately to the north, would be the northwest, I guess, around the, uh, in that abatement there, um, and unlikely to be developed. But is there a possibility that the, that land could be purchased and would we not be better off doing a, uh, a projection that uh, is more conducive to the ownership of any land uh, immediately adjacent to, to that property for future consideration? Or is that just not something we, we worry about? Um, through your worship, that was not something that was taken into consideration with this application. Um, if the land was to be purchased, it would be purchased through the MNR, um, and the township would have nothing to do with that. Yeah, and, and I'm sure the, the, the buyers would be well aware of where the projection is at that time. Okay, thank you. Good luck trying to buy a crown lot. <laughs> and I say that on behalf of anybody who has tried. None of my list of to-dos. <laughs> um, Councillor Cooper, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can. Just a quick observation, uh, Sydney. Um, in terms of the properties that are on Six Mile Lake, it's my understanding that the water level on Six Mile Lake is controlled. So we have a high water mark showing here, but in effect, the uh, water's edge and the high water mark, for the most part, unless there's a spring flood, are one and the same. Is that not correct? Um, through your worship um, to Councillor Cooper, yes, that's correct. Um, you can see there's a little bit of a difference here between the water's edge and the high water mark, um, which I guess just would have been the variation of when the survey was completed. But um, yes, the on Six Mile Lake, it is regulated. Thank you. So the only reason I raise this is that almost everywhere else in the township, not everywhere, but almost everywhere, we have to worry about the high water mark but in this particular case we don't i just wanted to bring that forward and thank you thank you any other comments from council seeing none i have moved by councillor hazelton seconded by councillor graziano be it resolved the council passed the closing bylaw 2024-034 to stop up, close and convey part of the original shore road allowance in front of broken lot 17, concession 14, being part one on plan 35R-27379, formerly Baxter, now in the township of Georgian Bay, at 387 Burbick Road for the purchase price of $16,093 plus HST. All those in favor? And that is carried. Thank you very much. Oh, how did my camera get turned off? Sorry about that. My apologies. Or maybe I should apologize to everybody now that I turn my camera back on. Okay. I'm afraid, everybody, another speech. We're entering the Planning Act public meeting portion of our meeting. And so this morning, there's a public meeting scheduled for one proposed zoning bylaw amendment. I will briefly summarize the procedure to be utilized for the meeting. First, the clerk will advise council as to when, how, and to whom notice of the public meeting was circulated for the proposed amendments being considered. The clerk will also advise the appeal procedures. Next, Staff will advise of the purpose and effect of the bylaws and provide any other information that is relevant to the applications, and the clerk will summarize any correspondence on file. From there, the public will have an opportunity to provide comments on the amendments being considered. Please be respectful of time and be concise with your comments. All commentators request the re are requested to state their name and address and sign in on the sheet provided. After the public discussion, the public meeting will be closed. Council will then have an opportunity to provide comments for clarification. I now declare this meeting to be a public meeting pursuant to section 7, 22, 26, 34, and 53 of the Planning Act to deal with the following proposed amendments. A, an official plan and zoning bylaw amendment files 023-06 and Z, that should be 023-06 and Z23-19 for 117 Port Severn Road North, 2829816 Ontario, Inc. And 
B, official plan amendment 024-01, Township of Georgian Bay, Development Services Department, 24, report 2024-65. To our clerk. Notice that the public meeting was sent by first class mail to the respective owners and assessed persons within 120 to 800 meters of the property subject to the proposed applications and to those persons and agencies likely to have an interest in the applications. These notices were sent at least 30 days prior to this morning's meeting. Included in each notice was an explanation of the purpose and effect of the proposed applications and a key map showing the location of the properties or a description of the lands to be affected by the proposed amendments. Other relevant information may have also been provided. These circulations were all provided in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act and the Township of Georgian Bay Official Plan. Members of the public are advised at this point that unless they make an oral or written submission to Council before Council makes a decision on these applications, that any subsequent appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal may be dismissed by the Tribunal. Anyone who wishes to be notified of Council's decision respecting the proposed zoning bylaw amendments must submit a written request to the Planning Department. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Kratke, I think you're going to lead off this conversation, are you not? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. With your permission, I will share my screen. Applications uh, number 02306 and Z2319 were revised in the later part of February of 2024. Uh, the subject lands are approximately located at municipally and municipally known as 117 Port Severn Road North. The agent for the applicant uh, is MHBC and representing MHBC is Jamie Robinson and Chloe Patton. The Google satellite view on the screen shows the approximate location and existing character of the subject lands. As per Council's request in the past, I've tried to shift the property boundaries as best I could to better reflect where the subject lands are located. The purpose of application 02306 for the subject lands is to propose amendments of subsection E4132 in the official plan for the Township of Georgian Bay increasing maximum density from 40 to 53 dwelling units per gross hectare. The purpose of application Z2319 for the subject lands is to amend the Township of Georgian Bay Zoning Bylaw 2014-75 as amended regarding Map 150 in Schedule A rezoning the subject lands from Tourist Commercial Type 1 CT1 Zone to residential multiple type two, with the exception number to be determined, hold number six, that is RM2 XX H6 zone, and table 9.4 in subsection 9.4 be amended to include special requirements and provisions. A, notwithstanding subsections 4.14 and 4.41, decreasing the minimum front yard and shoreline setback from 20 meters to 19.5 meters. B, decreasing the minimum rear yard setback from 7.5 to 3.5 meters. C, increasing maximum density from 30 units per hectare to 53 units per hectare. D, decreasing the minimum number of parking spaces from two to 1.25 per dwelling, and E, allowing covered walkways with a maximum width of 3.75 meters, maximum height of 4.5 meters, and minimum setback from lot lines of 0 0.4 meters. The effect of the proposed development is shown on the proposed development site plan on the screen. That effect of both applications 02306 and Z2319 on the subject lands is to allow the demolition of existing cottages and construction of a 48 unit multi building residential development comprised of stacked semi detached and townhouses, not to exceed three stories 
with 60 parking spaces. Additionally, I wanted to draw the attention um, of Council to one of the cross-section drawings included with the application. I'm sure the agents for the consultant will walk Council in great detail through the proposed development. But the proposed site plan now before Council leads to a development that benefits from adapting the existing topography of the site to allow for a great deal of parking to take place under a structure and not to be on the ground as it were. Now, this is a new approach, relatively speaking, to Georgian Bay, although before COVID-19, the township practice was typically to have a public meeting for information only. This is the first time we are returning to that approach. And so there's a, a bit of a difference between my report to you. Um, as well, the revised applications uh, propose the first significant development in what is the village center of Port Severn. And so for two reasons, we want to hear from everyone before I give you my recommendations. And as well, peer reviews have only started as supporting documentation has come in during March and the last uh, few days during April. And so we have a lot of work still to do, but we want to hear from, from council, from the agents and from the public. Although my report draws your attention to the um, Port Severn Urban Village Center Master Plan and Design Guidelines, I just wanted to highlight on the screen what those guidelines discuss, because some of you may or may not be as familiar with them as, as this application might require you to become. This is the town hall that we are located, this symbol here. This is the square in front of the library, the commercial development that's taken place um, at the off ramps. This entire area, this is the park that was developed by the township and other governments. This is the bridge that was developed by the township, the district and other governments. But this entire area is planned to become the village center of Port Severn. And as such, the way in which Port Severn Road was visioned to develop is very different from how it is today. And these are the types of um, aspirational guidelines that the township has endorsed and they are still reflected through the official plan as policies that council will want to be consistent with. So at this point, I really want to leave the um, bulk of this meeting for me to listen to what the agents have to say, what the public has to say, and what council has to say. And so the summary that typically would be included of public comments will really follow in a much more meaningful way at the next meeting, which is not likely to take place before July. However, again, that is subject to change. And certainly we will keep everyone who participates informed as to when that meeting will take place. Thank you very much. Appreciate that overview, and uh, not only of the application, but also of the let me call it the timeline and how we're, we're going to try to manage things. Um, I'm guessing by seeing that Mr. Robinson and Ms. Patton have uh, taken their place at the desk, that uh, perhaps the applicant through you would like to speak to this. So, please go ahead. Thank you, Worship, and good evening, council members and staff and members of the public, as mentioned. Good evening? Or sorry, good morning. <laughs> it was I'm a late like... night last night. <laughs> just seeing if everybody's paying attention this morning. <laughs> so, yes, my name is Jamie Robinson. I'm a partner with MHBC and a, a land use planner. And with me today is Chloe Patton. She's one of, the, one of my colleagues from our office who's been... Uh, integral to this file. The owner of the property is also here, Mr. Rigo, and uh, Mr. Batanen is, is here as well with him. 
what I'm going, what Chloe and I are going to do today, just as a roadmap, Chloe's going to give some of the background information. We're going to try not to repeat what, uh, what your planner has provided, and then we'll provide some additional details with respect to the development. So if you can bear with us for, uh, for five minutes or so, we'll work our way through this uh, presentation, which is about 10 slides. So, Chloe? I'll try to now this slide deck. Thanks, Jamie. Um, MHBC has been retained to review the planning merits of an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment to permit the redevelopment of the shoreline property um, located within the Port Severn Urban Center um, in the township of Georgian Bay. As um, Mr. Crack, he had indicated applications were previously submitted in September of 2023 to permit a 65 unit four story um, residential condominium apartment. A community open house meeting was conducted in October of 2023 to allow the public an opportunity to comment on the proposal before a public meeting. Um, changes have since been made to the design um, and an application has been resubmitted in February of this year. The revised proposal includes a 48 unit residential condominium comprised of 24 stacked semi detached and 24 stacked townhouse units. A series of technical um, supporting studies have been prepared to support the application. This includes a stage 1, 2 archaeological study, environmental impact study, functional servicing and stormwater management report, as well as a flood hazard letter, parking justification study and traffic impact brief. The subject property is identified in red on that figure. It is located on the shores of Little Lake on the north side of Port Severn Road. You can see to the east, we have the Severn Marina, um, Christie's Mill, as well as the Trent Severn Waterway, Lock 45. Um, and to the west, we have Port Severn Park and to the south, Highway 400. Um, the subject property is outlined in red there. It has a lot area of 0.92 hectares or 2.3 acres, a lot frontage of 110 meters on Little Lake. And the property is currently developed with a cottage rental establishment, Sunny Lee Resort, which is fully serviced by municipal water and sewage services. Um, the property contains 15 rental cabins, four docking areas, as well as various amenity areas, which include a pool, volleyball court, and campfire area. Um, so, as mentioned, the original proposal was for a one building, 65 unit, four story condominium apartment with surface parking. Um, if you just go to the next slide, it'll show uh, various perspectives of the building. As you can see, the building occupied the majority of the frontage um, with limited views of the water from Port Severn Road. Um, and I will now turn it over to Jamie, who will summarize the community information meeting, provide details on the proposal, as well as the required amendments. Thank you. Thanks, Chloe. Uh, so just in terms of, of some background here, we, uh, as Chloe mentioned, we submitted the original application back in September, uh, had the community meeting at Driftwood, where we had some really good turnout to that meeting from various members of the community. We had lots of folks there that were provided comments in support of the application and the in really support of, of uh, additional, the potential for additional dwelling units being brought to the community. And in many instances, some of those folks were retirees that uh, owning their cottage property was becoming uh, harder and harder and maintaining it. And they did look for an, are looking for an opportunity to stay on the lake, but in a venue that provides uh, some additional services and, and maintenance. So this was the potential opportunity for some uh, succession planning on their parts. We did hear some concerns at the meeting as well. Some of the concerns related to environment, um, some of the concerns related to traffic, density of development, and uh, the overall massing of the building. So we took that information back, uh, met with our clients and the architects and thought about the proposal in a, in, in a bit of a different light with, some, with respect to some of the comments that have been provided, both from members of council, from members of the public, and then just are also further observations from that meeting. And what we came back with was effectively the revised proposal. So I'll get into some of the details about what that revised proposal entails. So firstly, <clears throat> it, it, it proposes a reduction in the number of units. So 
a reduction from 65 units down to 45 units. So that's part of, sorry, 48, which that's really an attempt to deal with the whole density concept or density issue. Uh, one of the amendments that's required from the official plan and from the zoning bylaw is to uh, provide relief from the current density provisions within those uh, documents. Just a word about the density requirements in the OP. This is really the first application that's ever tested those. Um, the official plan was developed about 10 years ago, a little bit over 10 years ago. And it uh, had some some limited vision in mind, I'll say, but I would suspect that any development that we were to proceed within the Port Severn settlement area is likely to see at least a zoning bylaw amendment and quite possibly an official plan amendment. So, um, so that's the reason for the density considerations. What the official plan amendment does not need to do is modify the designation. The designation of this property, although it's historically been used for tourist commercial purposes, the designation is a residential designation at this site. So the, the official plan does contemplate over the long term residential uses on this site and residential unit styles. Uh, what this application does is we believe provide uh, an appropriate density for the site given its location and given the site's attributes. Uh, in terms of other modifications that came to light, the original proposal that Chloe illustrated on the screen identified a building which was four stories in height. Um, this, these proposed buildings are, are two stories in height. They are, um, they are stacked semis and stacked towns. And I'll show you an image in a few minutes that gives an example of what those, looks like, what those look like. Uh, from a parking space perspective, the number of parking spaces have been reduced from 83 down to 60. And as identified, much of the parking is contained within the building. So uh, through underground parking, there are, is some surface parking in the central location of the site, but much of it's underground. Parking something that was a comment that's been, been raised. Uh, I'll get into this a little bit more, a little bit later. But as you go through this presentation and look at the images, something to just bear in mind is, is this is an urban environment. This is a, in a situation where the units are relatively small and you really have to weigh as, um, as, the, as members of the public and ultimately members of council, how much surfing surface parking is going to be provided versus how many units and, and that built form. So it's an important it's an important consideration for for a, a settlement area. Um, just in terms of an image of the site, so I've got a couple images here that provide an overview of what the proposal could look like. Uh, a couple of key changes as well as the previous design had basically surface parking in the area of Port Severn Road, where the, the revised proposal has units that effectively abut Port Severn Road and does provide for an area of landscaping, which I, I would suggest is more in line with the earlier drawings that Mr. Kratke provided that illustrated the Port Severn master plan and the, the streetscape that could exist there. Uh, this this does also provide an opportunity for pedestrian connections along the street. So whether it's a sidewalk or a trail along Port Severn Road, which I know is something that's missing, but the proposal does provide an opportunity for that. Um, sorry, one. I'll just go back to this previous slide. One thing I should have mentioned is um, you'll see in some later slides and one of the requirements of the zoning bylaw amendment is for a covered walkway. So the area that's in brown around the site uh, in, in the interior portions of the site, those are effectively covered areas and I, that, that the architects designed. And we'll show you what those, uh, those look like in a moment. One other point of note, just in, in looking at this, um, this slide, is that the requirement for setback from the high water mark, so the, the zoning bylaw has a, a blanket 20 meter setback from the high water mark required, or, required or controlled watermark as the case may be on Gloucester Pool. Um, what's being proposed here, I think, it, I believe it was 19.5 meters, but just bear in mind, again, this is an urban situation or a service situation. This isn't a situation where we're on a, on a well and septic. Um, 
this proposal does provide amenity space between the existing dwellings and between the lake. So it's a little bit different situation than what we'd have outside of the settlement areas. So on Georgian Bay, for example, or Gloucester Pool or Six Mile Lake, where the they're strictly a shoreline residential designation. This is an urban area. This is, these are some concepts of what the proposed buildings could look like. Uh, it's the intent that that there'd be soft colors used that uh, would uh, would construction to uh, but but a bit more of a modern uh, modern, modern modern architecture being provided. Uh, these are again stacked semi-detached units and stacked townhouse units. So what that effectively means in each of these uh, buildings that's shown on the screen, there's four units to each one. So the reason I bring that up is part and parcel to the the parking questions and the concerns that have historically been raised with with respect to parking. So what's being proposed here is a reduction in parking from one one parking or two parking spaces per unit to one space per unit. These are two bedroom units at a maximum. The intent is that the market would be towards retirees or small families. Um, it's not a situation where large families could occupy these units. Uh, in terms of, I'll just wait for one second here. So in terms of the, uh, yeah, we're all awake. <laughs> so that's really uh, one of the key points I'd like to just raise in terms of justification for reduced parking is the unit sizes are are relatively small and the number of bedrooms are small this is a condominium proposal so folks that purchase a unit know exactly what they're getting purchasing one space and the 0.25 is for visitor that's the 0.25 is the surface parking that's provided uh, here's another illustration of the proposed units um, here's an artist uh, rendering. I mentioned the walkway and the covered walkway that's uh, that could be could be developed and that the zoning would provide for. Just some samples of the units, and again, just bear in mind there's four units within each one of these these buildings. So just a couple of I just got a couple slides left talking about the official plan amendment and the zoning bylaw amendment, and then we'll wrap it up. But again, these lands are designated residential in the OP currently. Uh, the permission is to go to 53 units per hectare, where 40 is, is what's currently permitted within the OP. We believe to make efficient use of the site, that this density is something that, that, that is necessary, and we believe it's in the public interest to provide these additional housing opportunities within, within the settlement area. In terms of the zoning bylaw, the zoning bylaw, there's a number of sort of site specific modifications that are requested and Mr. Kradke reviewed them. Uh, but uh, we believe they all assist with uh, achieving an appropriate design for the site. I've, I've touched on a number of them currently, just a couple that I just would like to touch on. So we've referenced a 3.5 meter setback from the road right of way. If you can see on this drawing, there's only a few, It's that's basically the closest point, it's 3.5 meters. So um, on that black block of townhouses, it's on the right right hand side of the drawing, it's on the left hand, uh, on the right and the left hand corner where that 3.5 meters is proposed. The rest of the site achieves more than that 3.5 meter, uh, meter front yard setback. Um, in terms of the definitions, you currently don't have a definition in your zoning bylaw for what a stack townhouse is and what a stack semi is. So we're proposing definitions to, uh, to reflect that built form. That's quite standard that you haven't had that building built form in the municipality um, outside of the Oak Bay area. So it's, it's completely reasonable that there'd be a definition established to contemplate this form of development. Um, just in terms of a couple comments, uh, again, in, in conclusion related to the parking aspect, one of the comparables we've heard a lot about is Oak Bay and concerns at Oak Bay with respect to parking in that area and the, and the limitations with respect to parking. A couple differences with this site is, is its location. 
the unit sizes are smaller. They're oriented specifically to those one, two person families or very small, small families. Uh, and also this is a condominium development, which has um, specific visitor parking identified. I think that's one of the, the issues with some of the Oak Bay considerations is all the parkings within the, the driveways of the units to, to my recollection that there's no specific areas that are part of the condominium corp that are dedicated to visitor parking. And that's not the case here. There's specific areas that are designated for visitor parking. Um, so with that, um, your worship and members of council, that completes my presentation and Chloe's presentation. Just we'd like you to bear in mind that that this is a location within a settlement area. It is a, a property that's designated for growth and development. And it's our opinion that the proposed OPA and ZBA are in the public interest. So going forward, we look forward to hearing the public's comments today. That's what this meeting's really all about. Um, so that if necessary, uh, we can review those comments and address them in a further submission if required. And we look forward to coming back before this council with, uh, with a recommendation report in the near future. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, I've been advised that we have received some correspondence on this, so I'm going to go to uh, Madam Clerk to uh, let us know about that. Okay. Um, so one letter was received from the District of Muskoka stating that they would not be opposed to the approval of the above noted application, providing the proposed bylaw is amended to include a holding age symbol removal of, and for that removal of the age should only be considered when the following provisions have been fulfilled. A traffic impact study has been submitted to the satisfaction of the District and Municipality of Muskoka. A functional servicing report has been submitted to the satisfaction of the District. A stormwater management plan has been submitted to the satisfaction of the Township and the District. Availability of water and sewer capacity be confirmed to the satisfaction of the District. And an updated and an updated to the scoped environmental impact study and wildfire risk assessment that was prepared by Zygoptera Consulting. Thank you. Um, do the applicants themselves wish to speak to this or are you doing everything through your, your planners? Okay. Um, members of the public, anyone, <coughs> excuse me, anyone in the room or online who wish to speak to this matter? Sir. <coughs> where, wherever you're comfortable. Uh, you could, it, only, only if there's a crowd that needs your seats. Hello, my name is Mike Corey. Uh, okay. We're at 1910 Henry's Landing, so we're on the lake as well. You got that? Um, we've been sort of watching this development come around for a little bit there, and we've been involved in similar ones on other lakes. And there is, in my belief, there is a need for more of this style development in the area. Um, we have calls quite regularly seeing if we can find such such facilities and such such dwellings on the lake system. So we're inclined to support it. Um, we have heard comments from the public with regard to it looking pretty like boxy and glassy, and they've seemed to fix a lot of that from the previous design to the current design. Um, we'd like to encourage it to go further, which we've just heard through the presentation that there's going to be more wood, more neutral coloring blended into the environment um, a little bit further. But uh, beyond that, uh, I believe that we're in support of it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wish to please come forward, name and address and go ahead, please. My name is Henry Axiak. I live at 90 Old Mill Road. I've been a full-time resident since 1990. Um, I am not against what uh, Cliff wants to do, but I do have questions that I don't believe have been answered. When we bought Whitestone Lodge, we needed 200 feet per lot. I don't know what the, the frontage of this property is. I don't think it's been mentioned. I haven't seen it. So if we if we had to have 200 feet per lot to get five lots for five families, now we could put in 48 people on, I don't know, 1,000 feet? 
1,500 feet shoreline he's got? I don't know. Mr. Mr. Crackett, can you answer that question? Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my understanding is that the street frontage is approximately 110 meters. The water frontage is longer, but the key difference would be that this is located in a fully serviced urban yes. community. And, and not only is it within the urban community, but it's within what is planned to be the, the new village center for that urban community. And so I appreciate that, that there are different requirements in different locations in the township, but those are the requirements of the official plan and the zoning bylaw. Okay. The other concern I have is it's still, in my opinion, a lot of people in one spot. Okay. All those people, even though they may be retired people, they will have sons or daughters come up with boats. So it may end up being more boats. And when they go out looking around, I'm on White's Bay, they're going to come up and look at the falls, they're going to go to Big Sheep. The increase in water traffic in front of my place, and I've got, I'm speaking for several people in, in our base that are cottage that couldn't make it. That's a concern. We don't need extra boat traffic, especially on the weekend. When I lived here, my kids were younger, I couldn't take my kids water skiing on a weekend. Because the boat traffic is just too horrendous. The last thing we need is more boat traffic, more people running around on this lake. This lake, this lake is still fairly rustic, even though it's got some big homes on it, but it's still fairly, fairly rustic. And I think to put in so many people in one spot and running around on this lake is, it's hard on the lake. You, your worship, mentioned the indigenous people and looking after the area. This isn't helping the area. This is impacting the area tremendously. As a mechanic and as a teacher, the amount of pollution that goes into the lake with more people on the lake is hard on this lake. I don't, I have accepted, I'm not against him developing it. There's still too many people. It's got to be reduced more. Well, yes, well, thank you. And, and, and as I think you appreciate that one of one of the things that they're in front of us asking for is to be allowed to put, put I'm going to call it roughly 50% more units on the property than is current the current zoning would allow. So that yes. is one of the questions absolutely in front of council will be the uh, eventually will be the density. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else wish to speak to this matter? Well, if you change your mind, you have a few minutes to do so. We're going to go online in the meantime. Um, we have we have one individual online that wishes to speak. To. Okay. I wonder if we, okay, there we go. Ms. Howes, you wish to speak to this matter? Uh, yes, I do. Would you be able to turn your camera on? Oh, <laughs> um, how do I do that? <laughs> uh, you, you don't have to. It's just a preference. Um, you know what? I've just got a new computer, and this is my first Zoom call on here. Um, so I guess I'm going to just stay a name. Okay. Um, and we need an address as well, please, for our clerks. Oh, okay. I'm a property owner on Six Mile Lake. Mm -hmm. Um do you need the, the actual address? Madam Clerk. Okay, well, you spoke yesterday, so we'll, we'll use what you said yesterday and presume you haven't moved since then. Uh, no, I haven't moved, no. And and I'll just add that I'm also a property owner just south of of uh, the, the district as well in uh, Wabashine. So I'm, I'm kind of a local resident too. Um, uh, yeah, I didn't realize that this development was happening until I was looking for something else. And I have to say, I was a little bit surprised. Um, I'll try to be faster than I was yesterday. I know I took up too much time. My my opinion of this is there seems to be a disc, quite a disconnect between the envisioned version of what the community was 
wanting to look like by your plant, the, the gentleman who showed the pictures earlier, like that looked really nice. And I've always thought that Fort Severn could be a very nice looking uh, place. And so those pictures look nice, but this development is very urban, very modern. I think there is a big disconnect between the community planning vision and this project. Um, I also agree that I think it's far too dense. Um, I have no idea what the back uh, elevation of these buildings is going to look like because I couldn't really find a picture of that. But I think it's going to be a lot of concrete or something that just totally blocks out um, view from behind that project. I actually drove by yesterday on the way home from the meeting uh, and try to envision what this is going to look like on that piece of property. And I think it's just going to be overwhelming. Um, also, I don't agree or I don't understand the target demographic. Uh, if it's going to be retirees, I don't, as a retiree myself, I don't see that type of architecture or whatever appealing to a retiree, as well as the services a retiree requires. Um, are there going to be elevators in each of these units? Because us retirees, we don't like stairs. Um, and just the parking is absolutely a problem. Uh, having moved here from um, more urban areas, uh, you need a car to get around here. So whether you're just, if you're just one person, you're living in that place, and it is very small, one car is okay. If you are a couple or more, um, yeah, you both need cars and where do we put them? And that was why my husband and I didn't buy an Oak Bay because we both drive and um, couldn't couldn't park our cars in garages or whatever. So it was a deterrent. Anyway, um, I oppose it on a whole bunch of levels and I just wanted to go on record to say that. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for your input. It's appreciated. Thank you. Do anyone else online at this point? Um... Madam Clerks, Madam Clerks. Oh, yeah. Okay, please come forward. Good morning. Uh, my name is Morris Lucchese, and I own the property at 195 Port Seven Road, just a few doors away from this development. And uh, we've been watching it, and just taking a look at things happening in the neighborhood and what we need in Port Severn. And I think a development like this is what's needed. Uh, where we're located in on this part of the lake uh, is conducive to some more urban style development. And I don't think it's a big jump from 40 units per hectare to 53, to be honest with you. And uh, I appreciate the way they designed the parking actually underground, which would make the view and the look of the whole development much more peaceful than having vehicles all over the place. And uh, just thought I'd put my input in on the positive that I think we support some type of development in that stretch. And just want to make some comments in regards to the uh, configuration of how that development sits with the town's uh, view of that whole area. And, and the way I, I view it is from the lock to, let's say, uh, just past Driftwood. That that part of, the, of uh, Port Severn, the urban village, uh, need some participation on the street, and I appreciate the way those those homes are designed. I'm assuming I'm not sure if you can put it back up on uh, on there. If uh, the homes on uh, Port Severn Road have frontages, that way we have activity on the street. You want to have activity on that street side. So I, I think uh, all in all, I'm I'm in favor of this type of development, and uh, I welcome it as a neighbor. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. Anyone else? Well, I'm afraid then I'm turning it over to council and we'll see whether any councillors have any questions or comments about this application. And already I see councillors Jarvis and Cooper. So councillor Jarvis, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll go, let's see, first the question, I think Jamie probably can answer this best. Uh, I know we've had an issue or there have been issues over at, um, at Oak Bay with regards to uh, streetscaping, parking, emergency services, snow removal over the years. Are the streets, I mean, it's, there's a limited amount of street 
access there anyway, but a street's designed to allow for uh, emergency vehicles to be able to get through should there be parking on the, there, there is there's no parking allowed on the streets in front of these units, correct? To your worship, to the councilor, that's correct. That, so if the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment were approved, site plan application would be required and also plan a condominium. And part of that is that it gets a fulsome review from planning staff and your fire chief. So it does need to meet all fire access route requirements and this development concept would do that. So, and, and then there the is other, no on street park. Okay, I appreciate that. And then the other thing is uh, snow removal. Is there um, accommodation for any buildup of snow to be moved to spots somewhere on the property? Through your worship to the councillor, there's some areas for limited snow storage on the site. If there was significant snow events, it would have to be taken off site. But again, it is this property, it would be a plan of condominium. So that'd be something the condominium corp corporation would have to deal with. And that is a common situation in, in urban environments with condominiums. To our planner, would that be about right? Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I'm going to start by answering your first question which is this is very different from oak bay the oak bay roads are in a lesser right of way because they are generally speaking private roads this is a full 20 meter or wider in some locations uh, public road right of way where the actual developed road at this point in time is much less than the right of way that exists so if you looked at the um, drawings in the uh, Port Village Center uh, Master Plan and Urban Design Guidelines, they actually show how yeah, the existing right-of-way could be developed with both two lanes of traffic as well as street parking and a separate recreational trail intended in the summertime for bicycles and pedestrians, but in the wintertime for the snowmobile trail um, with a sidewalk still on the same side of the street as the parked cars so there is ample opportunity for further discussions to take place between the district whose road it is the township and the applicants with regards to how the streetscape itself may be developed and how that may um, add potential uh, street parking into the mix Thank you. A um, few, few more questions. I just continue with the parking that I see, I think on the, on the, the, the site plan there that we've been given, there's 16 accommodation for 16 vehicles parking just uh, uh, on the streetscape there. Uh, and we're talking about parking within the units themselves. Is that a single car type garage situation in each of those units? Or would that be uh, something that could accommodate more than one vehicle? Through your worship one vehicle per unit underground. So the 16 extra units are envisioned for any additional vehicles and visitors, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, okay. And then um, my other critical one is uh, stormwater runoff. I see there's quite a, um, we've got um, documentation about stormwater runoff and how it would be mitigated. Um, I'm always concerned when we see a lot of concrete going in anywhere that we get a lot of runoff as a result of it. I know we're not looking at industrial runoff, but we are looking at, uh, you know, people washing their cars, oil, gas, whatever gets onto the streetscape, ending up in the lake. Um, the current uh, development there is a lot of grass, which I presume uh, acts as a filter, though limited in scope, because I'm sure it's not that deep. But uh, are we confident that the stormwater runoff uh, relief that's um, been proposed in the uh, documentation is adequate for uh, what may occur during a heavy rain event. If I maybe just can take sure. that, Your Worship. Um, so firstly, uh, what you're talking about is is more of a site plan issue than it is an OP and zoning. Okay. But the principle of, of yeah. establishing appropriate stormwater management is a official plan amendment and right. zoning bylaw amendment consideration. So that being said, whatever whatever happens on this site, whether it's this development or some other development, it's going to generate stormwater sure. as a result of it. So that's point number one. Point number two is that whatever stormwater that's generated from this site would have to be 
a stormwater management concept has to be designed, whatever the development is, and it has to meet ministry requirements. So MOE requirements for the quality and quantity control before it's released into, in this case, it would be the lake. So whatever gets approved at the end of the day does have to meet Ministry of Environment regulations with respect to that and has to be approved. So in all likelihood, there, there'd be some set area for sedimentation and oil and grit type separators, those sorts of things are likely a necessary requirement where you don't have a stormwater management pond, for example, but it does have to meet ministry requirements at the end of the day. And this would be something we'd be looking at with site plan agreement later, later on anyway, correct? Yes, your engineering department or consulting engineers would certainly have a review of that and make sure it met all township requirements as well. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, peer reviews have just begun because some of the reports were only delivered in the last few days. Uh, uh, the peer reviews will look at the details in the supporting studies. In the case of uh, stormwater management, uh, without benefit of the peer review, what I can say is that on a preliminary basis, the work that was prepared uh, for the application suggests that the stormwater may actually be better managed okay. after the redevelopment of the property than it currently is. And in fact, they're talking about intercepting flows from uh, Port Severn Road North. So there certainly is the effort. Um, what we need to do from the township's perspective is a way to ensure that our uh, peer review experts agree with the detailed calculations that have been done by Tatham. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Council, I'm gonna ask for your patience. An additional member of the public is asked to speak to this and I'm gonna go over to uh, Ms. Elliot Fraser. I see that you have signed in to uh, make some comments. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much for letting me speak. I know I was having problems trying to uh, speak today. Um, I represent the Glacier Pope Cottagers Association. Um, I'm the president of it. I just want to share with you that we're fine with some development on the lake. We are concerned about the density. Um, I, we're glad to see that it got scaled back to uh, scale back somewhat. But one of the questions that we do have is can, um, would you be able to actually put four units together? From what I gather, Ford is against the whole four unit um, uh, putting four units on one lot. So I'm wondering if this um, would actually fall under what he's suggesting. Uh, that's my our number one thing that I wanted to talk about. Another thing that we had concern about is the whole parking. Um, the 1.25 um, spots per unit, um, we're questioning that. Um, as the uh, speaker mentioned, as the presenter mentioned, you did say that you would have, uh, sorry, there would be one parking spot underground, but most people end up driving up to this area. There isn't a lot of public transit into this area. So we believe, as a previous speaker mentioned, that there's gonna be more than one person showing up per unit. Um, in, I mean, more than one car showing up per unit. So we question whether or not you have sufficient parking. Another area that we're concerned about is docking. Um, we wondering, you know, what's gonna happen in terms of docking. We had seen the initial proposal that there was going to be several docks put in front of the, um, in front of the units. And I didn't see any, anything, I, I didn't see any plans with regards to docking. So, you know, what, what's gonna happen in terms of docking? How many vessels are people going to be allowed to dock in front of Sunny Lee? And then a fourth uh, concern we have is trailers too. Um, where will people put the trailers that they bring out um, for their boats or their vessels? Um, we don't really see anything in the plan regarding that. Uh, I think other, other concerns have already been addressed such as the storm water, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm gonna to go to Mr. Crafty uh, initially uh, to um, address the planning questions and then to the applicant if they have any response and then we'll go back to council. So I'll try and keep the order. Um, Premier Ford, I believe is concerned that an as of right proposal by the federal government for fourplexes wherever 
a single family detached dwelling is allowed without being reviewed might cause unintended consequences such as over uh, overworked streets, uh, sanitary and water services stressed beyond their capacities, et cetera. This is a very different situation. In this case, the applicants are preparing the appropriate background studies and documents to support their application. We do not yet have the peer reviews that the township has requested from our experts, and those will be forthcoming and discussed at the future meeting before council. Um, next, in terms of um, uh, how the waterfront will continue to be used in detail, I share the public's interest in learning more about that, and we will be discussing all the um, comments raised during this meeting with the agents as time permits in the nearest future so that they can address them. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Robbins or Ms. Batten, did you want to add any response before I go back to council? Uh, just a couple couple things. Um, Jeff answered the, the four items going together, the parking, we've heard that concern previously. Docking, the proposal is to maintain the existing docks that are there now at this point. If for some reason there was additional docking proposed in the future, it would have to go through the site plan process that's subject to site plan control. So that's not on the table right now. What's on the table is the existing docking that's there stays. The concerns with respect to trailers, um, it's just like anybody in any other apartment building within an urban area. If they've got recreational vehicles or recreational equipment or boats, there's a, and specifically in this area, there's a number of nearby marina properties that they could rent space from for their trailers or for their boats or to provide access to the lake. So, so I don't see that as a, as a concern in this instance, especially given the proximity of so many local marine marinas. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. Councilor Cooper, you're next on my list. Yes, and thank you, Mayor. Um, I first wanted to say uh, to <clears throat> Jeff Kratzky that um, I thought uh, his report was most interesting and exciting, and I'll tell you why. I, uh, Jeff, it, the fact that you're actually planning to get all the feedback from the public and from council and not bring anything forward today is amazing. It's the way it should work. And I would encourage our CAO and our director of planning to do so more often. We should be listening. And I, the reason I mention this, and it's not a criticism of anybody in particular, other than making a recommendation on the same day that you get feedback from the public, to me is disingenuous. You've already made up your mind. You haven't responded to what you've heard. And I would recommend that in the future that we have time between when we get feedback from council and the public, uh, that we do the same thing as you're doing today. So uh, Jeff, I'm delighted and uh, uh, I wanted to uh, comment on that. I have a couple of other quick comments, uh, but I'd like to ask our CAO, um, are we gonna move in that direction that I'm suggesting here? Just putting you on the spot. <laughs> I'm go going a little off topic, but I'm sure you can you can uh, craft a quick response and then we get back to this particular application. Mr. Mayor, first of all, I can take absolutely no credit for this. This is uh, Derek's <laughs> guidance towards a return to the process. <laughs> so while I appreciate uh, Councillor Cooper's uh, kudos, uh, they are not owing to me. I, I oh, just fully take, give them to Derek. Take, to take at least a piece of them. <laughs> <laughs> take it when you can. <laughs> Uh, CEO Marriott, please. Yeah, um, thank you, Mayor Kutsi. And, and, and I was going to say, I wasn't going to give you the answer, but I know someone who can, and I'm, I'm looking across the room here. <laughs> Director Whiplet, please. Thank you, through, through the Mayor to uh, Planning Council. Um, so there's there's two sort of different um, uh, public um, um, meeting approaches. Um, today, we're in the context of a public 
meeting. Um, and I contrast that to a, to a public hearing and they're nuanced terms, but um, so in, a, in the context of the committee of adjustment, where we're considering minor variances and, and consents, as an example, it's a public hearing con a context and um, the process is set out such that um, it is a hearing and that hearing renders a, a decision. Um, so moving forward, I think um, um, this township can continue to expect that for the purposes of applications like minor variance and consent, um, unless there's a decision to defer, um, this township can continue to expect that consents and minor variances um, will be considered at a public hearing. There will be opportunity to receive public input. The committee will deliberate, but that decisions will be rendered at that same hearing. Um, that's very different than what we're doing here today with a public meeting. And it is um, um, intended that moving forward, that public meetings for things such as official plan amendments, zoning bylaw amendments, generally more substantive applications will follow this uh, format. Notwithstanding prescribed timeframes in the Planning Act, um, from staff's perspective, it's important um, to Councillor Cooper's comment to have a forum where public input can be gathered without um, that happening in a context where there's already a recommendation on the table as a backdrop to allow for that information to be obtained, allow some time for additional information to potentially come in even after the public meeting, all that to be distilled, worked through, um, sometimes reworked um, and brought forward at a future date with a recommendation when things are ready. Um, there may be some caveats to that. I can envision a situation where perhaps um, a zoning bylaw amendment that's the subject of a public meeting may in fact be the subject of a recommendation report on the same at the same meeting. But that might be an example where, for example, um, a situation, for example, where a zoning bylaw amendment was required as a condition of a severance. And that severance has already gone through a public process. There's been deliberation and the zoning bylaw amendment is required to fulfill a condition or address a detail. That might be a, a relatively um, minor type situation where it's generally possible to have a public meeting, consider a zoning bylaw amendment um, and render, um, consider a recommendation and render a decision on the same, at the same meeting. However, generally speaking, moving forward, um, council can expect that official plan amendments and zoning bylaw amendments will follow the format we're seeing here today, subject, of course, to council's direction on that, um, that uh, will hold the public meeting, gather input, and reconvene later at another date to consider a recommendation. Well, thank you very much. Now, Councilor Cooper, any questions or comments on this spe specific application? Yes, um, there are. And uh, thank you for allowing that. Um, I'm, I think it's rather important to identify uh, best practices, and I'm seeing a best practice here. It sounds to me from that answer, we could apply what was just said to planning council. Maybe not the committee of adjustment, but it sounds like planning council, and that would be very beneficial, regardless of uh, timelines, et cetera. And I think these discussions are worthwhile. It's unfortunate in Councilor this particular Cooper. case. I, I got your point. Thank you. So my, here are my points. Um, I guess... Um, while this is an interesting application, I think it's not minor in nature. It's a 76% increase in density, um, so I, I don't see it as being minor. I'm concerned about waterfront and water protection, water body protection. So I think uh, for Mr. Kratzky, I'm encouraging that uh, more thought be given to that. There's been some points raised about parking and parking spots. We know that we've had challenges in other development recently in our area where there wasn't enough parking provided. And uh, we do we need to make the same mistake again? I don't know, I don't think so. So I, I think it's a valid concern. And um, I think uh, uh, that's, that's it for now. And uh, once again, uh, thank you, Jeff, and uh, take credit when you can. And uh, Derek, uh, I liked your answer. I think uh, we may have a road forward will, which will be more positive. So thank you. Councillor Predko. Thank you and through your worship. Um, just a couple of, uh, I, I don't want to repeat a lot of what people have already been saying, but um, I, I'm just curious about parking. Um, there have, and, and to echo the other concerns, is, is one parking spot per unit 
maybe um, you know really inadequate for for I think the the lifestyles that people live up here, and I'm just wondering if there's been if it's possible or if it's been done to look at other small townhouse condo um, sites across Muskoka or in in, um, in uh, Simcoe County that may be comparable to do a, a comparison of. of parking spots to what's being proposed today? And I guess, Mr. Robinson, if you could answer that. Certainly, um, through your worship to the councillor. So as part of the development application uh, submission, there was a parking study prepared by CC Tatham engineers. And uh, they looked at four different, four other comparable developments. Mm -hmm parking generations associated with those developments and based on their review and their input it was their determination that the 1.25 spaces per unit that's being proposed is justified so that the parking ratio is not something that myself or chloe have come up with it's something that we're relying on technical support technical reports to uh, to justify um, as Mr. Cracky mentioned, the municipalities having peer reviews done of the of the studies that have been completed. So, so you'll get a response from your technical consultants on whether there's any issues with the methodology that was undertaken as part of that report. Okay. So, they are looking at other sites. Okay. Thank you. And uh, uh, and if I may, that that parking report was added to the file yesterday. Oh. Okay. So, so not like we had much chance to have a, a boom. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and I, uh, I, I know from where you are in your, your proposal today to what's going to be eventually presented as a final um, uh, um, um, plan amendment and eventually what goes to customers as a sales package, the elevations on these buildings are likely to change and, and common element amenities are going to be defined. Um, and I, I, I do note that on your diagrams today, there's no waterfront development uh, or any structures at all. So uh, that will come when we get to site plan review. And I'm assuming for a uh, plan, and this is a question to uh, uh, Mr. Whitlip. Uh, I know with Bill 198 and everything, we've changed to what council sees from a site plan for site plan review. Uh, for a development such as this, site plan would come to council for for their review or does it uh, stick strictly stay with staff through the mayor um so site plan is a delegated authority but that's subject to council's direction so council can at any time direct that um site plan come back through planning council for for consideration okay thank you um and noting that the the district re requests are, are the other things that i would have in mind i'm fine sure. thank you very much councillor hazelton so I have a few things. Do I have to start again? Yes. Uh, I have a question for uh, for Jamie. Um, I think if I heard correctly, maybe I was dreaming, but in the uh, public uh, session that you had, that you attended and drove um, on site, back in October, I think you said that there would be some um, organizational uh, commitment to no Airbnb in the property. Did I hear correctly or was I dreaming? To your worship, I, I don't remember that. So <laughs> I'm not saying there can't be, but I don't remember that comment. Okay, maybe I was dreaming, but uh, I have heard it before where new developments like this go in and there are uh, there are potential candidates for Airbnb and the uh, policy of the, uh, the condominium is that they exclude Airbnb. And so um, I think that that's something that um, surfaced in that meeting that uh, everybody that was at the meeting that I that I observed thought that was a good idea. So um, I would put that out there. Um, I wanted to uh, you know, cycle back and uh, talk about, um, there's an interesting timeline, and this is question here is uh, for, for you, Jeff. Um, 
your timeline is that you're going to uh, hold this meeting and then you're going to gather all kinds of feedback and you're going to hold another meeting in July. Um, and you're looking, I saw something here, can't find the, the, the actual exact line, but you're looking for a minimum 30 days uh, to assimilate the, the information before um, any further considerations. Do you know where that was? I can't, there we go. On a part of the recommendation, item number three, um, uh, township shall not schedule the next meeting to evaluate the applications till participants' correspondence to the public meeting have a minimum of 30 days to consider the supporting documents. Now, we just heard from our mayor uh, that we got all this documentation on Friday and today. Um, and yesterday. so, pardon? Yesterday. Today, okay, yesterday. Um, so, uh, in my world, it's uh, sliding forward. So, uh, I guess, first of all, I, I love the idea of um, time for consideration. Um, thank you, Derek, for uh, holding this as a public meeting um, and for not making a recommendation so we can consider the input. But I would offer that if all this documentation, which is impossible for us to understand and assimilate in two days, um, that uh, we don't consider this the last public meeting. So I guess my question for you is, your targeted meeting on July is for the next step. Is that going to be a public public meeting? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the answer is it was not specifically intended to be a public meeting, but certainly if through uh, the peer review comments, which are still outstanding, this public meeting, the input that is being received, and additional discussions with the agent and the applicant, there are substantive changes made to the application. There might be a need for an additional statutory public meeting. The difference, though I, I want to be clear, uh, the difference between a statutory public meeting and a meeting of council in public is not that access or um, uh, information is withheld or restricted. It's simply that there's an additional process whereby if someone wishes to speak to you to address some matter or issue, that they would need to make a, a, a request in advance to appear as a delegate. So they would still have the opportunity to address anything that they wish to address before you make your decision. Additionally, I think the, the reason for me wanting to ensure that there is a minimum of 30 days from the time that we have all the peer review comments and we've addressed them with the agent is to ensure that your decision is not done in haste, that you have ample opportunity to consider all input from, from the uh, applicants, from the peer review experts, from myself, from the public, any additional input that is received from the public will certainly be made available to you. Um, so that your decision has appropriate opportunity to take place after you are confident you understand the matter before you. So thank you very much. I uh, I appreciate the the focus on you having all the info that you can so that you can present that to us and that we can feel comfortable that we've had time to digest it. Sadly. Uh, we don't have time to digest all the voluminous reports for up Friday and yesterday. Um, and so um, clearly that's not something that we should be expected to uh, even consider, but more importantly, they're not peer reviewed and, uh, and no consensus ha has been arrived at through the peer review process, which may take a while. I don't know. Anyways, um, thank you for that. Uh, I would encourage us, um, given that we have historically benefited from community involvement on matters like this. And uh, I was absolutely delighted uh, when uh, the, the owners and, uh, and uh, Jamie sponsored uh, kind of a, call it a cocktail hour or something for community input. Um, I will offer, no, I don't know what else to call it, a gathering. I didn't have any cocktails at the time. But anyways, the, the point I'm trying to get to is um, when I, I would say that successful developments of this scope and nature um, do, uh, do need to go beyond the minimum for public input process. 
And the more that takes place, the more successful that um, uh, development, I think, is likely going to be. So I would uh, very strongly encourage, you know, that we recognize that there is likely going to be a need for uh, additional public input. We can't accept, expect for a second that public would have received and assimilated all of the information that we now have as of yesterday. So um, I think that's a, an important factor. Um, <clears throat> I read your traffic study, and I have to say that I'm very disappointed in the comparators uh, because there are very few comparators that are even similar to the Township of Georgia Bay. And so one of the things that I'll share with you is uh, at our planning advisory committee on Friday, uh, where we have lots of planning expertise, community expertise, um, it was suggested, and I, we've kind of heard this already today, that um, regardless of who lives in these units, they're going to want to have guests on weekends, they're going to want to bring toys here, they're going to want to have a place to get rid of their extra cars and their extra and their toy trailers. And uh, the 1.1, sorry, the 1.25 number, in my opinion, doesn't cut it, and it didn't cut it with anybody on the planning advisory committee in our discussions last Friday. Um, and so I would suggest that uh, two is a good number uh, as a minimum. But here's an idea that uh, I, I don't like to complain about things without trying to suggest maybe there's a solution to it. You know, there may be properties in the community that would like to offer uh, off-site parking for cars and trailers. And uh, there is possibly an, an ability for you to uh, establish a contract with these other organ these other locations uh, for trailer and car parking um, so that you can actually get to that number two because I think that I think we're um, fooling ourselves if we don't recognize that people are going to bring toys and other guests and at 1.25 it's going to be a fail in my opinion um, I'll pause there for a second. Thank you very much. I think the pause will be longer than a second. Councillor Graziano, please. Thank you, and through your worship, um, I have to make a comment with regards to our HVAC system. It seems to go on every time I'm about to talk, and it's a little cold under here, so I do apologize. If you guys hear my teeth, my teeth chatter, it's likely not me being nervous. Rather, it is me being cold. Um, with that said, I am torn. Um, and and the reasons for me being torn is, um, in one hand, I understand that um, the Port Severn North Corridor is prime for development and needs to be developed. Um, that development is likely going to stimulate our microeconomy in many ways from our local developers or uh, contractors, perhaps participating in the in the development as well as um, you know our gas stations and our restaurants here um, for staff that are um, concluding their day. On the other hand, um, residents have brought forward some some concerns that we've heard today. Um, I, I've, in understanding and working with the development team, um, I find them to be strong corporate citizens who listen and understand to the community um, and have done so. And we can see this through um, the second iteration of what has been proposed here today. Um, initially, it was one wall of condos. It is now broken up to, um, you know, to try to blend more into our community. Um, Ms. Elliot Fraser shared some common issues, and, and rightfully so. Her membership are my constituents, or a portion of her membership, rather, um, are my constituents. And I have heard similar concerns, specifically in that the density is just too dense. Um, for the intended lot. Um, 48 units seems to be uh, quite a concern for the community and, um, and understandably so. Um, for that little lot, um, that is a lot of units that are being put on it. But on the other side, I understand that the developer needs to, to make a profit. Ultimately, they're not a charity. And, and so they're here to, to hopefully uh, at the end of the day, walk away with something to show for their efforts and all of the uh, opportunity costs lost in this development. 
Um, other concerns that I heard was that there was no landscape plan and as such, we really don't know what the shoreline vegetative buffer is gonna look like here. Um, there's a couple of renderings with some, what looks to be evergreens, um, but aside from that, we really just don't know what um, and how the shoreline is gonna look, which then of course comes back to the view of the canoe in that, um, you know, if, uh, if the residents are staring at a, um, albeit broken up wall of individual um, units, uh, it's still going to impact the, the aesthetic of the lake. Um, and uh, that is a concern to many constituents. We've heard parking time and time again, I'm not gonna beat that horse down. Um, I would strongly recommend to our planner to strongly consider that. It seems that there's a consensus here within council that planning may be a problem, or excuse me, parking may be a problem, as well as the community. Um, trailers seem to be an issue, of course. Um, I do have a question, but before I go into my question, actually, I do have two questions. I'm gonna echo Councillor Cooper and water protection as well. Um, we need to do a thorough and have a thorough understanding of what and how we're gonna preserve our waterways. Um, we've heard traffic on the lakes and, and that is a concern. We've heard impacts to the environment. Um, and I, I wanna make sure that we are very thoroughly considering all of those aspects. Um, with that said, my questions um, directed to um, the applicant's planners. Do we happen to know what the depth of these garages will be? I'm assuming that the garages will be underneath the units themselves. Uh, it will not be uh, what I assume is going to be underground parking such as that in a perhaps urban area where there's a building up atop of it and you're actually going down. Um, rather, it's just going to be underneath the unit. So am I correct in assuming that it's going to be just garages under the units? So your worship to the councillor, I do not have any details with respect to the interior dimensions of the garages, other than I know they'll have to be large enough to fit a fit a car, but we haven't got to the detailed design stage yet of that. And herein lies my problem. Um, what do we define as a car? Uh, we've had some issues in other areas of our community whereby uh, garages were included as part of the development. Um, but pickup trucks seem to protrude out of the garage, which forces them now to park out front, um, which protrudes into the roadway and hinders passers or, or vehicles from coming and going. Um, and so depending on the garage, I could see that as being a potential issue for um, the ability. And, and let's be realistic, we, I, I will agree to disagree with the comments made by um, the applicant's planner in that he defined this as an urban environment, uh, perhaps in the context of Port Severn, and perhaps in the context of what the future development would look like for this corridor, it may be deemed as urban. However, I still perceive this as rural waterfront. Um, and so from my perspective, I, you know, I am going to assume that the majority of people who purchase these units are likely going to purchase pickup trucks or have pickup, pickup trucks, or there will be a portion of people at least that will have pickup trucks along with the toys and their boats and all of the other things that they'll be using here uh, in our area. And so I, I want to make sure that we consider that um, and strongly consider that that's an issue. The other question that I have is that on the drawing it shows, and I'm, I try to look deeper into the actual measurements there. Um, on the drawing that shows the units in yellow and it shows the driveway uh, and the, the surface parking spaces of 16 parking spaces, um, I try to determine what the width of the road is. And it looks to me like at its narrowest points, 5.2 meters. Uh, I'm assuming the measurement is in meters and not in feet. Um, and I wonder, have we or will we be consulting with our, um, our emergency services to confirm that? Uh, there is no issue with regards to the width of that road coming and going in case there's an, an emergency evacuation that's required, given the density as well. Through you, Mr. Chair, the quick answer is yes, we will be doing a fulsome peer review process, including our fire services internally. Um, perhaps I can also just quickly share my screen to uh, help with the discussion, understanding where the structured parking is going to lo be located. Um, this picture, which I showed to you earlier, shows under 
the buildings closest to Port Severn Road, an area shown in gray, that area in gray is the structured parking. Mm -hmm. And if you, sorry, if you look at the site plan, um, there are entrances shown approximately mid-building in both cases to those underground garages. And this one podium actually extends underneath the trees. And so my understanding of the parking layout is that it is a, a parking lot essentially under these two buildings nearest to the uh, existing Port Severn uh, Road, uh, which will function essentially as the parking for these units in the front, as well as parking for the units on which it is underneath, hence the covered walkway that is being proposed around the site, joining the building so that in inclement weather, someone can still walk between their unit and the underground or structured parking. It's not underground per se, it's partially underground. It's benefiting from the height of Port Severn Road uh, versus the height of the water's edge. Um, lastly, I agree with you, we need more information and I'm glad to hear this comment uh, from council and from the public. We do need more information from the applicants as to their concept for the water's edge itself. And these are discussions that this new approach that Derek has, has started with this application will allow us to have with your input, which is most helpful. One follow-up, if I may. Um, one addition, and thank you, thank you, Jeff, for for um, adding to to that and clarifying the the parking situation. Um, one other thing that I do have a concern with and a question um, to our planners is that um, what if possible should this uh, should this move forward, um, what can we do to help mitigate the impacts to the immediate neighbor? Um, I don't deem this to be a normal um, development or, or you know renovation, if you want to call it that, whereby perhaps an immediate neighbor is going to be impacted briefly by a contractor coming and going. Uh, this is a large development, and I know that there are neighbors to the left, if you're looking directly at the unit from Port Severn North, that are residential. Um, they're going to be, uh, you know, impacted by this for quite a period of time. I can only imagine that this is going to take, you know, um, upwards of perhaps close to a year to development to conclude, maybe even longer. Uh, with pounding and, and you know um, and drilling and, and so on. So what can we do to ensure that the, the immediate neighbors, um, you know, are are, or at least the the impact is mitigated for for immediate neighbors? Can we do acoustical berms? Can we can we consider those as part of the development as well? What can be done? Uh, and over to you. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, construction uh, mitigation measures may partially be included in site plan control, but to a large extent, construction does not fall under the Planning Act. The province does require uh, contracts, uh, contractors and other um, construction activities to adhere to standards. I know that in the past, this municipality has experienced situations where perhaps the enforcement of those rules and regulations may have disappointed um, the public and council. Um, all we can say is that we will work together with these applicants who have shown themselves through their first um, informal public open house and through their significant um, revisions to their application to be very willing to work with the community. We will work with them as best we can to ensure that uh, the mitigation takes place, but our hand is weak from a planning perspective as construction is not controlled by the Planning Act. May I, as one additional? Um, and it may be prudent just to, to determine the distance between the most leftward units and the immediate neighbor. I believe it is a residential unit there, and uh, and I think that it's these these units are going to be in very close proximity to that home, and so they will likely be impacted for quite a period of time. So, uh, yes, we will definitely be looking at those measurements. I believe they are already on the drawings. Um, I, I can only say that we will do our utmost to make sure that, um, uh, that the applicants work with the neighbor to mitigate measures. Thank you very much.
Um, just a few comments from me, even though they may be to some degree uh, repetitive. First of all, um, I appreciate very much the applicants having their open house uh, a few months back, um, and uh, and and the rather high number of members of the public who attended that open house and, and were free with their comments and quite clearly they were quite a wide range of for and against that, that we were hearing uh, but I greatly appreciate that um, I'm also quite impressed with the applicant in that they came back with a, a, quite a significantly changed uh, proposal given the um, and given the comments that they had heard and all the input they received. I, I consider that very positive. Um, I will tell you in my experience as a resident in another community south of here, uh, there, are, there, are, there are more than one developer who comes back with something that totally ignores what they heard from the public, builds something or want, proposes something bigger and pretends with fancy words that they're responding to the public which in my mind was um, words I'm not allowed to say in public. So therefore, I, I appreciate that. Um, and I also appreciate that we're now getting here, here the, the, the staff uh, and the public for that matter are hearing everybody's comments and getting the input. And, and, and um, so I think this is all very positive. Clearly, we, we have a proposal that is challenging to some based on the density that we're putting, that they're proposing 48 units on a property that can accommodate per our current zoning, I'm going to say 28 because I'm not sure what the exact number is if you, if you do the ratios, but something significantly uh, smaller. Um, and that, to me, that is what our the, our, our residents and certainly council have to consider very carefully is do we want that level of density in Port Severn? I think that's something that we must consider. Um, and you know, part of that too is the reference to parking. And um, I, do, I did appreciate that uh, the parking report, uh, I, I, I very quickly reviewed the parking report, you know, and I love going through it and getting things like parking demand, fitted curve equation, and all sorts of fancy stuff. I don't care. What I do care about is that they are, there is a rationale in that parking report for the one and a quarter. The difficulty I have with the parking report is most of the comparisons are from Aurelia or other built up communities that are significantly larger than Port Severn. And I don't think that works. For me, it does not work because as has a number of other councillors suggested, when you're in a area where public transit is once or twice a week occurrence, taking you to other communities, um, where we don't have uh, very many Uber vehicles available to take us around, people have more cars. It's just uh, one of the things I heard from a number of people uh, at the, um, at the uh, the meeting, the open house a few months ago, and one fellow, uh, you know, expressed it very clearly. If you think my wife is going to drive my pickup truck, that's over my dead body. Um, because, in other words, what he was saying very clearly is there, they, they need two vehicles. Because if one's gone golfing and the other one got, wants to go shopping, um, they're not sharing a vehicle. I think that's a real concern. I think it's also a real concern. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm used to um, condo buildings uh, in, in, in cities um, where, you know, on long weekends, you, you get to park on the street because too many of the residents are having their Thanksgiving dinner or their or what have you, the Easter dinner, and, and all the kids and grandkids are showing up as you'd want on those long weekends. Well, in this case, these folks, these people are, are showing up are going to be parking at the public lot just down the street here because uh, you know, our, our, our roads cannot, especially in off season, cannot accommodate park vehicles on them. 
um, we can do to the snow clearing and what have you. So I, I think that's, I think the parking uh, review uh, has to come up with more, uh, more appropriate comparable, comparables, sorry. Um, I'm concerned about the streetscape. And I haven't seen too many illustrations other than the overhead with a couple of trees. As the density of Port Severn grows, there are going to be more and more people on the side of the street or potent down the road at some point, the sidewalks that may be built. And what are they going to be looking at? Are they going to be looking at a blank concrete block wall that hides the cars that are parked underneath these buildings? I think that that's something, you know, and, and I'm not saying that that's what you have planned. It's just, I don't know what has been planned. And I think that is has to be important for us is, what is this gonna look like to the neighbors wandering by or the people driving by? Um, and I think that's important as well as obviously what it looks like from the lake. And and, and I know, I understand that this is all preliminary that you have the, the, the architectural sketches um, and that doesn't tell us how these buildings are gonna be finished and everything else, but I, I think, that that is that is important. The, the the aesthetics do count, especially when you're so close to the road and you're in the uh, let me call it downtown area of Port Severn. Um, and so I, I think that's a factor that I, I'm hoping as we go forward uh, that is included. I mean that's probably part of the site plan uh, aspect, but I think that's going to be important. Is what, not only how is this property going to be used by the residents, but how is it going to be viewed by the neighbors. Um, but no, I, I, I very much appreciate the, the efforts being made. I, and the, these are relative, you know, personal story. I, I was looking at the designs and, and, and some, of the, some of the units were I think 860 square feet or something like that. And I thought, that's nothing. And then I had the pleasure of visiting my, a nephew of mine and his uh, wife in, in Toronto, and they were in a unit that was 850 square feet. And I was quite impressed at how efficiently that particular unit was designed. And when you get small, you gotta be efficient and you're very efficient in your skill. And I can say, yeah, I can imagine this. I can, and, and it, that their place was big enough to entertain. I was down there and the party had, uh, I think 18 people in their room. And by the, all of us were being there, all of us were able to park on the street. And I think that's where we have to consider that these folks who have that 850 foot unit, if it's well enough designed, they'll be able to accommodate uh, a dozen people for the occasional party or what have you. And if two or three of them are doing it, people are parking a fair hike away at, at this point from the uh, operator. So I, I, I mentioned that as I think to me, the density and the parking are the two most challenging and the ones where the I'll call it planning justification, the and the peer reviews are going to be uh, have the the biggest hurdles to clear. I can't. I'm not saying they won't be cleared, but those are the ones where I think a lot of the emphasis has to be. Um, I think I think I saw once I changed the screen away from the parking report. Other hands up. So, um, Mr. Crackty, is your hand reappearing? Okay. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. That was just for me to put that slide on uh, okay, to answer enough. the question. All right. So now we're going to go uh, see if council want to make any additional remarks. And uh, Councillor Cooper, I see your hand. Thank you, Mayor. I'll be very brief. Uh, just wanted to add in some a couple of things I was thinking about uh, during our discussions. Uh, I think you covered it very well, though. Uh, We've got to be concerned about the waterfront and the parking and the density. Um, and I think I covered a fair bit of that when I started, but I uh, wanted just to add a couple of quick things um, for our planners to think about. I don't know whether this is um, an old planning rule, but I, do under, I did understand that backlot development was prohibited and this is basically backlot development. And uh, is that um, something that's prohibited, uh, let's say in the rural areas, but in the urban area, you can have backlot development because that's that in and of itself is creating a hell of a lot of, a uh, heck of a lot of um, 
uh, density. So that was my first comment. I've got one, one other quick question uh, or comment. Uh, Jeff, can you answer that? For you, Mr. Mayor? Uh, yes, uh, Councillor, that is a situation where in the rural areas, uh, the official plan does have policies that restrict backlot development, not in the urban center of Port Severn, and certainly not within the planned village center. So uh, just as a follow up on that particular point, I think we need as council to think about the future. Um, and while it's an urban area, it's waterfront. And I'm not sure that we, if it was non waterfront, that would be one thing. So maybe we need to think about having uh, a, a set of uh, criteria for waterfront as opposed to not. Second uh, point, uh, Jeff, was that uh, just for a point of reference and also maybe just to see what's going on in the area there is a, a development in muskoka lakes called legacy cottages and uh there's um i think it's it's uh maybe a very worthwhile example it's very fairly similar to this there was a huge amount of resistance that was raised by the muskoka lakes association um and by uh, friends of muskoka so there's there's a lot of um, material there, let's say, just from a sort of feedback perspective, it might not be a bad thing to look at that. So legacy cottages in Muskoka Lakes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, Council? All right, I think we've had a very informative session. I, I trust that, I, I, I do see lots of notes being taken by, some and I appreciate that. And with that, I'm going to go to our motion, which is moved by Councillor Graziano, second by Councillor Jarvis. Be it resolved the Council for the Township of Georgian Bay accepts all information presented at the public meeting on April 9th, 2024, regarding the Township Official Plan Amendment Application Number 023-06 and Township Zoning Bylaw Amendment Z23-19 regarding a proposed development of the subject lands and refers all information to township staff for further discussion and review with all participants and correspondents at the public meeting. And the township staff shall not schedule the next meeting of council to evaluate the applications until participants and correspondents at the public meeting have had a minimum of 30 days to consider the supporting documents or studies after revisions to address peer review comments. Councilor Hazelton. I had a friendly amendment number four, uh, and uh, that would be, and then that the next uh, meeting will also be a public meeting. Okay. Um, Council, is there, is there anyone seconding that thought? Okay. So do we need a vote on that one before we go to this one, or do we just make it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. That the next So if I got it correctly here that the next council meeting on this application be a public meeting. All right, so the motion is as read with the addition of point four that, ne that the next council meeting on this application be a public meeting. All those in favor? All right, and that has passed unanimously. Thank you. Okay, where are we at? Yes, I think I think it's a good time to take a break. Um, so let's reconvene at eleven o'clock. So that's eleven minutes from now, give or take. Thank you. And hopefully, not much longer. Thank <laughs> you.
All right. You know, guys, it's from March. Okay. Are we ready? We're ready to get back at it? You're okay. You're ready now? Good. I hope so because the next report is yours. Our, our next in our agenda is the official plan. Make sure I got the. I hope I have the right one here. O twenty four dash zero one. The first planning report of twenty twenty four. That doesn't quite make sense, but anyway. Oh, official plan amendment. On um. So on notifications, Ms. Wanfer, over to you, please. Through you, your worship. Rep. The planning act requires notice of township wide planning application. Applications such as an official plan update to be published in a local print newspaper or mailed to every property owner in the township if a newspaper is not available. Local newspapers have ceased to exist as print editions and therefore may no longer provide reasonable public notice of planning applications. The cost of township wide direct mailing can be prohibitive. Alternatively, the Planning Act provides the municipalities with the ability to develop their own procedures, alternative methods for giving notice to consider various planning matters through an official plan amendment. Staff are proposing to amend the township's official plan to establish alternative public notice methods, including the use of the internet and other digital methods. Notice of this township wide official plan amendment was issued on February 12th to every property owner in by including the notice with the township's regular tax mail out. The District of Muskoka on March 18 adopted a similar official plan amendment known as official plan amendment 58, which added policies for alternative notification measures. This report is for information only and a recommendation report and a proposed official plan amendment for adoption will be presented at a subsequent meeting after public input is received. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Any correspondence on this uh, particular uh, application? One letter of no objection was received from the District of Muskoka. All right. Are there any members of the public? N not seen any out there. Are there any members on the online who wish to make any comments? Are we aware? Whoa. Okay. Ms. Howes, you're becoming a regular. Ms. Howes, can you hear us? If you, are, you are, if you're speaking, you are sure. muted. Here, there we yeah. go. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did say like I like you guys, so I like coming and talking to you. Um, and it would be nice to receive some uh, notification of things like this happening in the community. I would like to actually get more involved with, with what's going on because now that I'm living up, up around here. Um, I, I don't really uh, subscribe to a lot of things like Facebook or social media or things like that. As I've mentioned a couple of times, I am of the older uh, age bracket. So to have even like a, if a mass uh, emailing or something that's a little more basic than your Facebook, social media um, correspondence. Um, 
email is good. Um, the talk, the things coming in any tax forms, but I don't think we would be notified of, of everything that's going to be happening in those tax and notifications because they only arrive once or twice a year. Um, but yeah, my suggestion would be to do like a, an email thing. It, that would be helpful. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't think none of the other members are raising their hand of the public that are on. Okay. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Council. Council, any comments? Councilor Cooper, please. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, a big surprise in what I'm going to say just uh, next, but um, I concur completely with what has just been said. Email, emails, email to our constituents. Very high percentage of our constituents are very conversant with emails, but not necessarily interested in Facebook or social media. And if we rely on uh, trying to pull in our constituents as opposed to push out information, I think we're misguided. So I would suggest that uh, we explore ways to be able to email all our constituents about uh, current uh, Current affairs, whatever those are for the township, I don't think we want to deluge, send out a you know an incredible number of uh, uh, notifications. But I think we can use emails for notifications to our constituents, and they'd be very appreciative. And I would suggest to you that probably more than fifty percent of them would would like that kind of communication, and they do pay our way. They pay the taxes. We need to remember that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Graziano. Thank you, Worship. Um, no, no issues with regards to, of course, this proposal, of course, because I think it's just the inevitable evolution of, of our township and, and you know, need to, to, to communicate. Uh, one question I do have, um, and maybe a little bit off topic, but relevant to, to the discussion today is, is that um, does our CRM not um, have the ability to query our residents? as to what their preferred method of communication is. And the reason why I ask this is because, you know, we, let's be realistic. I mean, we are a retirement community. A, a large portion of our residents um, and seasonal residents are retirees, um, some of which, you know, don't or choose not to use um, computers and or smartphones. And so some may prefer to receive some formal, some type of formal notification, whereas others, may see um, email uh, or text as a more efficient option. Um, so I'm wondering whether or not our, our CRM tool um, can be configured in such a way that uh, the resident has an opportunity to choose their preferred method of communication and we can then um, you know, essentially cater to them and, uh, and their preferences. Thank you. Uh, CEO Mariotti, are you, are you the most qualified in the room to com or respond to that? Uh, I think was was Director Whitley going to going to talk about the CRM? I, I was going to talk about the the method of communication, and if uh, um, I, I think we've we've discussed this a few times, uh, so sorry to sound like a broken record, but we do have a a, a subscription uh, option on our website, and if we wish to subscribe, uh, whether it's Point Alert or through our township website. Uh, subscribers will receive emails and communications on a variety of issues, including planning uh, uh, planning applications. So uh, there is a, a method that people um, can automatically receive the information coming in and not having to constantly search outwards for it. And especially with the uh, with the new age of uh, newspapers being phased out, uh, electronic methods of, of, of communication. Unfortunately, we have to get, we have to. Uh, uh, adopt that uh, bandwagon because I, I, I don't think uh, we're going to go uh, back to newspapers anytime, sh anytime soon. May I with a follow? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and really the, the intent of the, the comment or the question was more so to cater to those that don't want to subscribe to a Boy and Alert uh, email. Um, because let's let's be honest, there is going to be a portion of our constituency or, or our residents um, that choose, you know, for whatever reason, whether they opt not to want to work with computers or just don't know how to use them, um, there's going to be a portion of people that still need to receive this information, um, but may not through um, you know current uh, current norms. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jarvis. Please. 
I just, uh, quick observation. I just think it's curious. The reason that uh, print has gone out is because people stopped reading it. Um, so therefore, it became uh, 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 an illogical uh, method for communication. I think it's great that we're finally getting around to looking at options on this. Uh, I'm not big on, uh, on a lot of the uh, social media platforms, though I do take email. So I think I, I appreciate that. But we come down to a push-pull method on things here. Which do we use and which can we use and which are we able to use? I mean, if we try and get people to sign up on the website, which I agree, and, and I do, I get the notifications uh, having signed up, subscribed to all that. Not everybody has, nobody seem, not everybody seems to be aware of it, but to be aware of it, they got to read it somewhere. And if they don't go to our website, then where are they going to read it? Because uh, there's no newspapers for them to read about it. Uh, it's a bit of a catch-22 in many respects. And so the other option is, as um, has been noted, everybody gets a tax bill. Uh, if we can somehow communicate ultimately with everybody via the tax bill that their best way of communicating with us is electronically and to get onto the website and subscribe or we start pushing things out to them, uh, whether they like it or not, for them to decide whether they want to get them or not. Uh, it's a lot of stuff to be discussed. I'm really happy to see it's finally happening. And, and, and if I may just jump in, Please. and actually in our tax bills, we do actually insert sections saying hey subscribe to our website or subscribe to this so so we do use that mechanism for the tax bill that hits everyone to try and maximize the promotion of these new avenues of communication director whitlip thank you your worship through to council so just to round out the conversation um as uh, ms one for indicated you know we're doing this because of the um um, the absence of, of print newspapers um, and the, the policy proposed policy amendment will allow us to utilize whatever methods or tools we come up with and if there's an option you know use using our CRM software software then then we'll explore that so it's this isn't something those implementation details we don't need to bake into any decision today but we will continue to look at the best way to get um, the message out um, and along those lines, I think um, in the absence um, of this amendment, and if we still did have print newspapers, what we would have been doing is putting township-wide notices as ads in a print newspaper. And I would um, um, go so far as to surmise that the, the approach we're taking now um, will probably give us better reach um, in the community than we would have under the old print newspaper um, uh, approach. Um, familiar with that approach in municipalities that have a large seasonal population and you miss a large portion of that seasonal population who don't read the local print newspaper. So um, no method is, is going to be perfect and guarantees that every household gets a notice every time. Um, but I think this will be an improvement. But again, the, the policy, proposed policy framework will um, simply allow us the flexibility to use the best tools available to us. And we're going to continue to explore those and find the best way to push that messaging out. Hit, hit the right button. Thank you. Um, Councillor Petko, please. Thank you. And, and through your worship, um, question primarily, I guess, for the CAO. Uh, the the methods of communicating are, are um, great that are inside Schedule A of the uh, amendment, but one of the one avenue that we don't use is the potential for other advertising, like physical advertising. So there are digital signs up north in uh, the, dis in the township along Highway 400 that we may be able to purchase. Um, there wouldn't be that many residents necessarily driving up and down the 400 in that section but there's maybe another opportunity to use township land to partner with somebody who would provide a sign for advertising that we'd be able to post our own notices on and perhaps uh, partner with SegBay for advertising some of their tourist and uh, business activities as well um, i'm assuming this could be potentially done as a partnership so there wouldn't be cost to the the township but it would be a longer term effort thank you thank you Councilor Hazel then <clears throat> thank you um 
I'd like to uh, bridge from what uh, Councillor Graziano was suggesting, and that is that um, a good CRM system will have the ability of uh, capturing uh, preferences for how people would like to be communicated with, and um, hopefully we'll get there soon with our CRM. Um, but what's really important is um, two planning advisory committees ago, uh, we had a uh, discussion about how to get the message out on some of the planning advisory matters. Uh, and we learned at the time that the statistics for our uh, subscription process are less than 5% of our township. So we're sending out tax bills, encouraging people to subscribe, nobody does. And I can assure you that uh, given uh, my background in customer service in the world, um, nobody was ever successful without a defined proactive strategy to collect, capture, and use, uh, and get um, the appropriate permissions of use for uh, communications with customers. And that could either be through email, through text, uh, through WhatsApp, or whatever the strategies are. Uh, subscriptions are going to be a fail. Uh, that, that's a that's a that's a well, pretty much a uh, a well understood matter in the marketplace. Um, you have to encourage people to engage in and get signed up for these outbound communications, these push communications. So, uh, I would actively uh, encourage our staff to first of all un understand that that is uh, a a step that we need to take, and we need to find a a path forward, and uh, if in fact our CRM will support it, great. If it doesn't, then we need to find another vehicle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think uh, you've heard you're, you've heard some good comments. I, I think you know when we, we when we think about um, public notice, I, I'm, I'm presuming that mailing to uh, like the old-fashioned snail mail notification for people within a certain whether it's 500 meters or 800 meters would be part of this, so that people who are I'll call it in the immediate neighborhood of the planning application would be made aware with that alternative as well. Through the mayor to, to council, absolutely. So in the case of site-specific planning applications, property-specific planning applications, direct mail notification within the prescribed circulation radius, depending on the type of application, will continue to occur. This is only um, a measure to implement in the event when we have a township-wide planning application, whether it's something as significant as our official plan update, or even a, a small housekeeping amendment to the zoning bylaw that applies to all lands within the municipality. This would enable us to use other means of communication, um, A, in the absence of print newspaper, and B, in lieu of having to direct mail every resident of the municipality. We will continue to where um, timing works out to utilize and piggyback on the tax mailing process. That's how we pushed out the public notice for this proposed township-wide amendment because we needed a, a township-wide way of yeah. notifying people so we yeah. used the tax mailing this time. I, I, I think what's very interesting is we, we pushed out to uh, every property notification of this system of notification and a response was one person who I think was almost uh, I, I don't think she was here because of that particular notification. Um, so I, I think what we have to recognize, and, and, and well, I, I appreciate Councillor Hazelton's comments about maybe only 5% of the potential people have signed up. Um, my experience with the great majority of our residents is they don't care. They care if A, um, they want to make an application, if B, they want to know what their neighbor is doing, or C, if all of a sudden a bunch of people are talking about it and let's consider parking yesterday. And I think that tells me something is because parking got excited when two associations got involved and there maybe there are Facebooks or something. So in other words, somebody from these uh, associations uh, got interested. I think that any communication plan we come up with should include contacting all the known associations 
in our township and you know seg bay was mentioned our libraries might be considered um, all the cottage and neighborhood associations anything else we can think of because i think those residents of ours who have interest in these things tend to be members of associations because that's one of their vehicles of participation and, and learning and so i think we we have to consider that um though i strong i mean i'm strongly in favor of us <coughs> encouraging people to you know for us to create an email list even though i understand all the sort of challenges and restrictions of that um but i think a challenge with the email list is that we it, it's going to be a more complex system to take that email list and be able to sort it i'll call it geographically so that you know can, can we from that email list determine who's within 800 kilometers of a uh, development in um, part se downtown part seven um you know and, and, and so I, I i mean i'm all in favor of this but i think we have to consider numerous different options and and i also think we have to accept the fact that um the great majority of our residents don't want to be notified on most things ceo mariotti just a quick point, and you make a valid point, Matt Kutzia. The associations as well, they, they can subscribe through their email. So, so they, they would get whatever notifications that they like that they can then also cascade down to their, to their, to their membership. But I, to the best of my knowledge, for instance, and I'm just going to throw that up suggestion, I don't think we've created it where I could subscribe and get a copy of every planning notice. And, and so that might be an option to consider in, as you look at this program, is, is, is there a way to, uh, for our residents, those who are interested, to, to say, I would like to get a copy of every planning notice going out. You know, the way you send it out to council, you know, if, if you could add other folks to that. Director Whitlip. Uh, through the Mayor to Council. So um, with respect to the associations and other organizations that are representative of constituencies within within the township of Georgian Bay, um, it, it would it would not be a hardship to um, add those associations, um, not their individual members, but their their representative heads, um, um, to a direct mailing list. So when we are, as the mayor has suggested, doing some sort of township wide planning process, the associations and the other organizations will get a direct mailing. That's not that's not an expensive or hard to do piece. Councillor Cooper, you had an additional comment. Uh, yes, funny thing. Uh, I would just like to um, encourage that we do go through the associations and encourage them to uh, send it out to their membership. So there's sort of a two-step part of this. But I have a couple of other quick uh, observations uh, for our CAO. I don't think uh, this needs to be just exclusively about planning applications. I think it's really about communications with our constituents. And whatever is uh, going to be needed by planning is lovely, but we do have other communications that we would like to get out there. And uh, so that would be uh, what my objective should be, would be for this township, including figuring out a way <clears throat> to overcome the concern that's been raised, which is very few people have signed up. We need an incentive program. And there are some municipalities uh, that have used an incentive program to get people to sign on to receive information. And why not? What's wrong with an incentive program? I mean, look at what other big companies uh, that are communicating all the time do with, with their potential customers. They find a way to communicate with them. And I think we need to figure out a way to do that as well. So I would encourage that. The other way of dealing with they don't care uh, question and 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 uh, is this we could communicate by ward uh, because that tends to be your community uh, so that's one way to maybe it only goes out to ward three and or three and one or whatever the case may be so I I think there's ways to get to to uh, certain communities and not bother others which you know in in some cases you might say. 
why are we sending this out to somebody that's on an island way out in the middle of Georgian Bay? They probably don't care. So um, that's the other thing is figuring out a way to get a direct way to send something to somebody other than through the mail, which is expensive, through email. Get the email addresses through an incentive program. Thank you. I, I, maybe Councillor Cooper suggesting we give everybody a free parking pass if they give us their email address. Uh, yeah, well, that ain't going to work because we still pay at our marinas in Georgian Bay. So forget no, that. We're one. not going down that path any further right now. Yeah, well, you raised it. So there you go. <laughs> Councillor Hazelton. Just to kind of close the loop a little bit. So Councillor Graziano introduced the concept of a CRM. Uh, we supposedly have one. If I had an email associated with a property to CRM, I wouldn't even need to do a direct mail for a, uh, uh, a notice on the 800 meter. I could send an email with a red receipt requirement and I would have solved the entire issue at no cost. Uh, and you would be getting access to all the same information because all the properties in that radius are all part of our uh, geography and uh, we would know that by lot. So, I mean, the, the opportunities for efficiency are mind boggling and I will just offer as well that um, I have found when I go home after being at the cottage two or three weeks in the summer that sometimes I have mail from the township telling me about some planning thing that might be happening in my neighborhood, but I have no idea what it is because it was snail mail as opposed to email. And uh, I know this is like a broken record, but we need- So we don't need to repeat it too often. We need to embrace yeah. email outbound, not subscribe, but push. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, please, to our treasurer. Thank you, Mayor Kutzer, and um, through you to Councillor Hazelton. Um, we do actually have Town Suite, which is a full ERP system, so it does incorporate a CRM system within it, um, and that is something we will be looking at implemented, implementing down the road as soon as we have um, our internal network uh, fully functioning. So I just want to make you aware that is something that we are looking into. Thank you. Thank you. But if I can just ask, I, I presume that people will have to nonetheless give permission to use their emails. Yeah, okay. Moved by Councillor Jarvis, seconded by Councillor Predco. Be it resolved that Council directs staff to repair a recommendation report in a bylaw for Council's consideration at a subsequent meeting. Shouldn't we say what this is about? Just. Yes, it would be. So, one, one moment, please. Re yeah. yeah, just make a report. We'll, we'll be happy to consider it. <laughs> Planning notes, notes, or something. All right. Be it resolved that council directs staff to repair a recommendation report and a bylaw for council's consideration at a subsequent meeting regarding O24-01, um, and I'm going to call it planning notices. All those in favor? Councillor Cooper? Could we not um, make this a little more general versus planning? I was <clears throat> suggesting that we need to figure out a way to communicate with all our constituents over all sorts of matters. So can't we use, take out the word planning and just say communication with our, our rate payers or constituents? No, because this is an agenda item on planning notices. But So, so I mean, then I, how are I, we going to get that solved? Councillor Cooper, I think staff has heard your message. It's not been heard. I, I'm, I'm, cer I'm certain what our treasurer said was about a, a broader thing other than just planning. All those in favor? And that is carried, thank you. All right. Well, I see it's just, it, it's just come up in front of my face right now. Councillor Hazelton, I believe you wanted to introduce a new matter 
if you could very briefly describe what that is, and then I'll see whether we get enough votes on council to consider it. So the, uh, so the matter is, is that uh, uh, we have a calendar time work um, where we have a planning committee, which was on Friday. And we Mike, have your microphone. <laughs> so I don't think he received notification. <laughs> don't call me, Mike. Uh, okay, so the uh, the issue is we had a planning advisory committee on Friday. Uh, we have council on Monday. We can't expect staff to pull all the resolutions from the planning advisory committee from Friday and put it in the agenda on Monday. Um, and what that res results in is, um, uh, for example, um, meeting on Friday. Uh, the next time when those resolutions could be entertained would be over a month out into the future, council meeting on May 13th um, or May whatever. Um, we have another planning advisory committee though on May 3rd. So we have a planning advisory committee which might produce recommendations. Those won't be heard until after the next planning advisory committee. Basically, we have a time warp here from a calendaring standpoint. And uh, the, um, the objective here is to uh, have an opportunity to bring those resolutions forward for consideration by council without having to wait an entire month. We can discuss what those resolutions are in a minute, but I guess yeah. the first step is to see if we have approval to talk about it. Ba ba thank you for that. I have moved by Councillor Hazelton, seconded by Councillor Graziano. Be it resolved that notwithstanding Schedule H, Section 2B-C and 3A-B of the Procedure Bylaw of 2023-117, Council hereby waives the rules of procedure for the addition of an item, namely 9C, Planning Advisory Committee recommendations to Council from the April 5th, 2024 meeting. I need four people to vote in favor to make this carry, which well, there's only six of us. Does that mean we, we still need four, don't we? A uh, question of the intent of this motion. If we adopt it, and the attachment with the recommended motions and resolutions that came from Planning Advisory Council, does that mean that we have automatically um, passed these three motions? No, or this, we have this to have... means we can discuss them. So th these are all very long discussions. And I know part of Council has already discussed them, but um, I'm just concerned about the, the length of time this would add to our, our agenda, considering I think number three and. Um, well, all three of them have, I would need to be brought up to speed, so I'm not sure. Thank you. Clerk White, please. Yes, there's too many microphones on, sorry. Um, through your worship, I was just going to clarify yet. This is step one and step two of going through them for the procedure body. You have to waive the rules of procedure to permit it to be added to the agenda because it wasn't on the agenda. So that's what this motion's doing. And then later on, correct, there would be discussion. Alternatively, as Councillor Hastings mentioned, they would come back to the April Council meeting under resolutions, under the consent agenda the for adoption, or sorry, the May meeting. Yeah. The, yeah, the next council. The next meeting. I don't know what month it is anymore, but so the next, the next one, yes. So. Any other questions on this particular motion? So the question is whether or not we will um, allow the, the, I think there were three motions from the Planning Advisory Committee to be considered today versus May 13th, basically. You could if you turn your mic on. <laughs> Just gotta get permission first. <laughs> so, so the normal process for for other my fellow councillors, the more normal process would be that all these resolutions would show up in the consent agenda, and if we approve the consent agenda, then they would be all accepted and approved. And if we wanted to pull them for discussion, we would do that. Um, but we can't even get to that consent agenda stage because it wasn't on the agenda for us to discuss. So the first step here, all we're trying to do is say, can we discuss whether or not we're going to accept or and or approve, uh, sorry, receive and or approve 
um, and we don't have to receive and or approve anything, but we can't talk about whether we're going to accept or receive um, until we pass the, this first uh, procedural process. That is correct. You, you wish, sorry, Councillor Jarvis. Further to what we are considering at this moment, uh, would we also want to consider uh, future situations that are similar to this. I mean, we don't want to have to go through this every single planning council meeting where we get a recommend, we get a request to listen to something that's occurred several days beforehand. Is it possible that we could consider rescheduling the uh, planning committee meetings so that their resolutions can come to planning council in a timely manner? And I don't know if we got to treat that separately, but I think we got to consider it. Yes, I, I, I would I would agree that that's one possible solution is just the, the whole that whole thing. Um, so what 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 I have immediately in front of me is moved by Councillor Hazelin, seconded by Councillor Graziano. Be it resolved that notwithstanding Schedule H, Section Two B C and Three A B of Procedure Bylaw Twenty Twenty Three Dash One One Seven. Council hereby waives the rules of procedure to permit the addition of item 9C, Planning Advisory Committee recommendations to Council from the April 5th, 2024 meeting. All those in favor? One, two, three, four. So we got at least four in favor. That's, a, that's the majority. So that is carried. All right. So I, I know that um, Councillor Hazelton sent out a notice this morning, an email this morning that listed um, three of the motions. You're you're hesitating. Oh, so okay, so we're now we're going to talk about that, but we're not talking about it yet. Okay. All right. So we're we're going to go now that we've added that to the new business. Now we're going to go back to um, or staff reports. We're going to go back to planning planning st application staff report 8A, which is the Ontario Land Tribunal Appeal Minor Variance A23-61. And that um, is a report that Ms. Wanford, I believe you're going to give to us. Through you, Your Worship, the applicant of minor variance application A2361 has appealed to the Ontario Land Tribunal the decision of the Committee of Adjustment to de deny the application. On February 16th, a public hearing was held for minor variance application A2361, where the motion to approve was defeated. Planning staff completed a detailed analysis of the proposal in staff report number 2024-20 and recommended approval. Staff's opinion remains unchanged, and we are unable to represent the township at the OLT hearing. Staff have provided council with two options to consider for rep representation and are seeking direction. Option one would be that council require the township solicitor to uphold and represent the township on the decision made by the Committee of Adjustment. And option two would be that council can consider providing no representation to uphold the decision of the Committee of Adjustment at a future OLT hearing on minor merits application file 82361. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Council, any questions or comments? Councillor Jarvis? Yeah, I, I know that there's some people to be watching this, and I think for the benefit of the rest of Council, I think it's really important from the standpoint of Committee of Adjustment, there are two councillors here that were in that committee meeting, and there were others. There's been a significant amount of correspondence as a result of, of this coming forward. And um, I understand the planning department's approach. I mean, this is all logical, obviously, the organization, but I think people need to understand that committee of adjustment was unanimous, unanimously turned down the, the application for starters, and that uh, committee of adjustment had more than one issue with the four tests 
that came before that are part of the uh, process in uh, considering an application. And so I, th I think while I, um, perhaps our Committee of Adjustments uh, uh, opposition to the um, recommendation in its detail is not something that I understand comes before the OLT. I think we all need to understand here that the Committee of Adjustment, as I said, was unanimous in at least uh, disagreeing with uh, the recommendations on three out of the four tests, uh, not just one, which I believe is what's in this um, document here. Uh, there were there was significant opposition right across the board at that time. Thank you. And, and I note that um, Dave Matthews, who's a member of the Committee of Adjustment, is in, in attendance and also wishes to speak to this matter. And I think I will uh, allow that if we can move him over. Um, to get his perspective on the Committee of Adjustment discussion on this. Mr. Matthews. Uh, good morning, I guess it still is, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, Nothing I'd rather be doing on a nice sunny day in Collingwood than sitting in my basement office chatting with you fine people. <clears throat> um, I think you probably have all received numerous communications about the concern of this application. Um, can everyone oh, hear me? One, one moment, please. So Can we try again, Mr. Matthews? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. All Please right. go ahead. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Member of Council. Um, I won't beat a, a old dog to, to death here. I think you've all received a lot of communication over the last day or so. The Committee of Adjustments is unanimously supportive of their unanimous decision. Uh, we feel that three out of the four tests were not met. Uh, the community plan of Cognachine was not taken into account. Community plan for some of you was developed with uh, thousands of hours of man hours um, put into it with consideration for many, many factors. Um, and we would strongly ask that council defend our position as committee of adjustments. Um, because this is this will set a, 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 a very serious precedent if if it is not fought and the, and the application can go through as presented. I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody else has any. Sorry, I don't have a prepared script. I was just um, hoping to sort of watch and chime in here. Thank you. Um, and, and I have one question before I turn it over to Council, and, and that is on the decision report that was shared with us. The notice of decision, the implication is that only one out of the four conditions was not met. And I'm just wondering if there can be any explanation as to why the Committee of Adjustment thought they didn't agree to three out of the four, and yet the decision would imply it was only it was only the not desirable one that was to director with them. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Happy to comment on that. Um just not to sort of re go over the pa past events, but the context of the committee's decision was that um, the motion on the table was a motion to approve the application with conditions. Um, that motion was lost or defeated. And that's where the decision making ended. So in hindsight, under those circumstances, it probably would have been useful had the chair or staff recommended to the chair that another motion be brought, brought forward to, ref to refuse the application if that was the will of the committee with reasons. So in the absence of uh, anything other than a defeated motion and a defeating motion then means it's lost and the application is not approved, um, staff prepared a notice. Clearly that notice of decision, which is required to cite um, or should cite reasons for the decision did not capture the full extent of what the committee members feel their deliberations um, consisted of. So I think moving forward um, in circumstances like that, uh, for, well, on, a, on a lost motion, 
another motion would have been appropriate. And it's my opinion that um, moving forward that all motions um, from the Committee of Adjustment either to approve or refuse applications should cite the applicable planning tests and whether it meets them or not. And that way we're, we ensure that the uh, decision, the motion, which then forms the decision that is issued to the public reflects um, the reasons for the committee's decision. I think I speak for all of council, so I'm gonna dare say thank you. We appreciate that things like this become learning experiences. And, and, and so I appreciate that greatly. I'm gonna turn it over to council now, and we're gonna start with Councillor Cooper, please. Thank you, Mayor, and <clears throat> I concur with respect to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this be a learning experience. I think it, it needs to be, um, <clears throat> but I, I think it's important to point out that uh, if this gets through, so to speak, and approved, we're setting a precedent, and that's problematic, very problematic. So I think it's important to understand when something like this occurs that precedent will drive what happens in the future in some cases. I also would like to point out that because this doesn't meet three of the four tests in my view and many others, one of the four tests is not minor. And if it's not minor, why is it in front of the Committee of Adjustment? Why is it not at Planning Council? It didn't come to Planning Council. It should have come as an official plan amendment or a bylaw amendment, and it didn't. Why did it not? I don't understand it, and <clears throat> this is not the first time that that's happened either. So we've got a lot of learning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Jarvis, your hand, is it still up or the new hand? <laughs> You've gone from your left hand to your right hand. This is, a, this is a new hand up. Please, please go ahead. Yeah, I and I want I want reassurance because I know it's been st and not necessarily stated here, but say to me that our reasons for denying, as they are stated in the documentation we have, are not going to be part of the OLT hearing at all. The only thing that goes to OLT is that we defeated it, and that's it. I do not want, as part of the defense from the applicant, this document coming forward. Uh, as evidence that there was only one one aspect of the minor variance that was uh, was denied. Director Whitley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, uh, Councillor Jarvis. That, that's a valid point. Um, with the OLT as part of their um, um, uh, their considerations, what they're required to consider under the Planning Act is they're required to have regard for the local decision, the committee's decision. And that decision in this case was, was to refuse um, the application. Um, my experience before the OLT, before that the local planning appeals tribunal, and before that as it was known the Ontario Municipal Board, is um, to Councillor Jarvis's point, certainly nothing prevents um, a party or their solicitor um, at a hearing from trying to shine a spotlight on that detail, the reasons for the decision, and trying to make hay out of it. My experience, however, is that at the same time, the OLT has none of that. Um, they understand their mandate, they understand their job, and when the context of a minor variance, they're conducting a hearing de novo. It's a brand new hearing as if it's being heard for the first time, other than they, again, are required under the Planning Act, and their more recent changes of the Planning Act, to have regard for the township's decision in considering um, their review of the application. So again, it doesn't prevent someone from trying to raise that discussion in a hearing, um, but my experience is that that detail doesn't get them anywhere. Please, uh, Mayor, yes. just to follow up. So there's no guarantee that this won't come up in the hearing. And I, I know that several of us from the committee have requested that that decision as published be revised to truly reflect what we felt transpired at that meeting, I understand that doing that has its own complications. And, and in that, for th those reasons, I understand that, but I do not. I, I almost want to guarantee that this 
document that it currently stands is not going to come to the OLT or be used as evidence because it's wrong. Sure. And I don't think there's a guarantee. Through the mayor, um, you're quite correct, Councilor Jarvis. There is no guarantee. Any, it, it, it's a document. It's part of the record. The decision was was issued. The appeal period is over, and the documents before the OLT. So, can someone raise it and try to um, delve into the details of the de the decision? They certainly could. Again, my experience is that that has no bearing on the considerations before the OLT, but it does not prevent someone from raising it. Um, I, I do want to speak to. Um, the notion of reissuing a decision um, again at this point um, not only would that muddy the waters as i think i've indicated earlier it's it's really not appropriate and i think would serve no purpose uh, in this case um, it would only be detrimental in my opinion to the township's position should they choose to defend their position the committee's uh, uh, position um, so I would strongly discourage trying to reissue a decision after it's been issued and in effect I hope it's a good one. I, I trust it is. So in future then, um, and I will step back in time as well, because Committee of Adjustment did, after making decisions, receive um, a confirmation that they had to sign off on. This is, I think, before your time or maybe just after you arrived, we were doing it. Yeah, we always received the, the decision with the requiring our signature, and we don't get that anymore. So we don't get a chance to see that decision right off the bat. So I don't know that we would have had time this time around to do anything uh, if we have that time to do it, to consider those decisions, especially on a denial. Um, I think it's truly important that we see uh, what has transpired in the document um, as quickly as possible after a decision. Thank you, Your Worship. And my suggestion would be in the interest of timing because the 20-day the appeal clock starts ticking from the moment the day that the, the decision is made not after the decision has been circulated reviewed and issued so again my suggestion would be um, to ensure um, that the decision accurately um, reflects the committee's um, decision and the reasons behind it that that be baked right into the motion at the committee of adjustment then that is simply copy and paste it into the notice of decision Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hazleton. <clears throat> so notwithstanding some of the things you've said today, uh, Derek, the, um, you, have, <clears throat> you have today informed us that you believe that the decision as written did not reflect the uh, beliefs of the Committee of Adjustment. Um, so we have that on camera. Um, I understand the concern from the community about having this document in play. Um, I respectfully disagree with the, your, your comments that having a revised decision um, wouldn't be useful. I believe it would. Um, every one of the um, members of the Committee of Adjustment appear to have a similar belief. Um, and the, um, I think uh, a, a, a decision update or a revised decision stating what you've already shared with us, which it didn't, it was written without reflecting the, uh, the opinions of the Committee of Adjustment. And here is a revised decision that now reflects the opinions uh, and the, the recommendations of the Committee of Adjustment. I think that would have value. Uh, how much value, I don't know, but it would certainly, uh, in the minds of the members of the committee, uh, feel like uh, their decisions uh, and their decision process was fully upheld, even though there was a misstep along the way. Director Whitlip. Thank you. Through, through the mayor. Um, so um, to be clear, I offer no opinion on how the content of the decision matched the committee's will. What I am hearing from the committee members, though, from those that are here, is that they feel that the decision did not fully reflect all their reasons. So that's that's coming from the committee. Um, as far as the reissuance of the notice, what I might suggest um, to council is that is in going back to the staff report um, that's before you, if it is council's direction um, 
to proceed with legal representation to defend the committee's decision, then I would strongly encourage um, that staff be afforded the ability to review with the township solicitor um, the notion of reissuing a notice of decision at that point, whether he thinks from a legal strategy standpoint that that's a good idea at this stage. Okay. Because um, I, what I was going to add is that right now, I'm sensing the council is going to pick option one, which is to defend the decision. If that's the council's wish, I'm I'm I, I'm thinking of whereas the first the first line right now leads whereas minor variance file A twenty three dash sixty one was defeated by the committee of adjustment on February twenty February sixteen twenty twenty four. Adding to that sentence, two things: one, unanimously, the word. And two, because they feel felt it did not meet three of the four tests. And therefore, in our motion, I'm suggesting that we put in what we have heard and believe to be the case. Um, Councillor Cooper, you want an additional remark? Just in that we're talking about uh, consulting with a solicitor, we need to decide who the best solicitor is for this. But when we do consult with them, I think it's important to understand what Councillor Jarvis pointed out. I certainly recall what he's talking about. The practice has been for many years that the committee signs off on the decisions when it's something like this. And this did not ha happen. So essentially, we have a we have an error in our practice. It's it's just it's an error, and and I I think if we can figure out a way to get that in front of the OLT that an error occurred, then maybe that could help us. I don't know. Anyway, I'm just throwing that out there as a consideration because that that was the practice of our committee of adjustment. Sign off. Thank you. Okay. Um. Mr. Matthews, you've had your hand up for a while. Was that from before, or did you want to make an additional comment before I read an, our revised motion? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will um, attempt to take it down, but I, I did just like to make a, a couple of comments. Um, and, and I think Member Jarvis and Cooper have touched on it. Yes, we used to always have to sign the, the, the decision. And if it was defeated, we wrote right then and there why it was defeated. Uh, I'd be a little hesitant about making another new motion. Um, it just seems like a lot of paperwork and, and further delays. But um, <clears throat> so I would encourage that we do get the opportunity again to sign off on our decisions, whether they be yay or nay. Um, I do have one question back to Mr. Whitliff when he said they're going to support the township's decision. Um, is that decision that you're, you're standing firm on uh, the recommendation of the planning department, or uh, will that be what council decides today? I, I think well, I think what Director Whitlip was saying was they stand behind their recommendation, but they will, and, and they they will respect what council decides, but they won't be be able to defend council's decision if the council decides to defend the OLT hearing then we have to hire external planners to do that yes okay I, that's fine i understand that and the other question i guess would be do members of committee of adjustment have the opportunity to be called as witnesses if we hire a new um lawyer no not normally why not because that's the way it's done <laughs> it, it, it's, it's it's that fancy latin nouveau word that gets in there they, they teach they treat it like a brand new case so then our knowledge even as a member of the cognizant community I, I i can't contribute oh as, as an individual you can always uh, apply to be oh not sorry oh you can't other individuals can my apologies i've been corrected because you're a member of the committee of adjustment you can't go to the olt But my okay. understanding is if they weren't part of it, they can't be, if they didn't object before, then they can't 
So, okay, Cognizant Cottagers Association could because they sent in a letter of concern. Yep. All right, thank you. All right, so I now have moved by Councillor Predko, second by Councillor Cooper, whereas minor variance file A23-61 was defeated unanimously by the Committee of Adjustment on February 16th, 2024, as it did not meet three of the four conditions. And whereas minor variance file A23-61 was appealed to the Ontario Land Tribunal, now, therefore, be it resolved that council directs staff to proceed with option one, which is basically defend, as outlined in report 2024-66 regarding A23-61 for 25940 Georgian Bay Shore OLT appeal. All those in favor? One, two, three, four, five. Come here in favor, go. That's, that is carried unanimously. All right. Thank you. Thank you. How long is it going to take us to get through these items or should we break for lunch? 15 minutes. I, I'm well aware of that. So we, 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 we have a hard stop, start, hard start at one o'clock because we have guests with regards to um, our committee of the whole. So whatever we don't get done now will be done after the committee of the whole. Let's let's try staff reports 9A and B. They seem closely related. And we'll go from there. Um, I believe that's Director Whitlib, but is it not you presenting these? Director Whitlib. Wait, are you willing to talk about Port Severn Heights to us? I am, Mr. Mayor. Good. Um, I, I know there are two separate reports, um, but uh, perhaps we can address them together. They're, they're essentially um, adjacent subdivisions. Um, there's a request, um, their draft plan approval um, um, is lapsing, has lapsed. They're, in, they're, they're currently in a temporary extension uh, period. The District of Muskoka has subdivision approval authority and also the ability to extend uh, draft plan conditions. Um, there's a request from the new owner um, of the developments for an additional two year extension. Um, both of these uh, subdivisions have been the subject of more than one extension um, to date. The initial draft plan extensions were respectively five years um, each. Um, so the new owner is asking for another two years in order to afford them the time to complete um, draft plan conditions, uh, the majority of which have not been fulfilled to date. There's been really little to no activity to advance these subdivisions from the time they were approved. Um, the Planning Act provides for um, owners the ability to extend draft plan conditions and they, it also provides for the ability for those owners to um, appeal to the OLT a refusal to grant an extension. When considering extensions to draft plan approval, um, from a planning standpoint, it's important to look at the application, the proposed development, to ensure that um, it still meets current standards in terms of um, official plan policies, zoning, et cetera. In other words, does it still represent good planning in the current uh, policy, policy framework? Um, in planning staff's opinion, it still does. Um, however, um, the only issue here is um, that there's been little material uh, progress on them. Um, I would advise council that um, that lack of material progress or perhaps frustration uh, on the part of the, the township with that lack of progress in itself is alone not adequate reason for which not to grant an extension of draft plan approval because again I come back to that it still meets current policy standards um, for consideration. Um, so the staff recommendation in both of these um, subdivisions is to recommend to the district because again, um, they are ultimately the decision makers here. The staff recommendation is to recommend to the district that rather than grant um, the two year extension requested by the developer, um, my both of my staff reports are recommending an 18th, 18 month extension. So a little short of the two years. I think that would better align with um, the township's um, upcoming official plan review process and the outcome of that. Um, we certainly wouldn't want to, it'd be less than desirable to have a situation 
where perhaps township policies may change and we have a draft plan approval that lives on longer than the township um, um, than the current official plan and therefore no longer aligns. So my recommendation is to support the draft plan extensions in both cases, but for 18 months rather than two years or 24 months as requested by the developer. Those are my comments. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Graziano. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, and thank you, Der uh, Derek, for um, uh, your recommendation. I was not aware that there's a new owner. Um, I know that there was a legal battle on this particular um, one of the parcels uh, that was recommended, and there may have been some change of ownership. Has it now gone back to the original owner, um, which was the one that had sold it to and and went through that legal battle? And the second question is, <clears throat> given that if we decline, um, you articulated that they would have the right to then take us to the OLT. Um, who's to say that they won't do that a year from a year and a half from now if they seek another extension on top of it? When can we stop this proverbial kicking of the can forward and get them to either break ground or get off the pot? Thank you, Th through the mayor. Um, so sorry to be more precise. I under my understanding is there is a a new owner. Um, that intends to acquire these lands. My last check of um, MPAC records, which you know aren't up to date to today, is that the ownership has not changed yet. Um, um, but uh, it appears that the request for draft plan approval, as authorized by the current owner, is coming from the prospective owner. So whether that transfer has occurred yet, I, I can't confirm that. Um, MPAC records still still have the old owner as uh, having title to the property. Um, as far as that uh, um, ongoing kicking of the can, I think was the analogy Councillor Graziano used. Um, it's unfortunately one I'm, I'm familiar with and there is nothing um, to prevent that. So if, if 18 months from now, um, it, sorry, should council choose to grant, recommend granting an extension and the, and the district of Muskoka issues an extension, whether that's 18 months or the district could choose 24 months, whatever the case may be, um, um, should that um, time frame run its course and they still have not completed draft plan conditions, we would luckily find ourselves in a position where we're getting yet another request um, from the owner for an extension. Um, usually those requests are accompanied by a fulsome explanation from the owner as to why um, they're unable to meet draft plan conditions or an update on what conditions they've met, which ones are outstanding and how they plan to meet them. That would be something we would we would look for from staff's perspective. In this case, it's simply a new owner coming on and they've said, look, we need more time. Um, so, um, you know, there is the opportunity to to ask them to sort of provide greater justification for their request, but there is no way to prevent that. So unless policies change, you know, this form of development is no longer appropriate um, in this location, in this form. Um, it is difficult from a planning legislation standpoint to not grant extensions. May I, as an additional? Uh, and a general comment followed by um, another general comment. It sounds to me as if this is intended to facilitate a sale um, in the hopes that the new potential owner would then have an opportunity to not have to come back to council and reapply, rather just have an extension of the application. So, um, and with that said, I I wonder whether or not, um, and it's just again a general comment, now would be the best time for them to take us to the OLT if they, that was gonna be the case, because it may scuttle that uh, sale. And if the current owner has no intentions of building, then such is life. They won't want to incur the 60 to $70,000 in uh, OLT costs. Thank you. Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Mayor. And, <clears throat> and I just want to uh, say that uh, I am very much aligned with what I'm hearing from Councillor Graziano. Uh, I think um, to be pretty assertive on this might make some sense. Uh, this has gone on. I mean, the original application was in 2007, for goodness sakes. 
and and approved in 2009. We're talking about a long period of time and several, and I'm, I'm not telling you anything new, Derek, uh, but several uh, new approvals. And, and where does it stop? So maybe the, the way to deal with it is to turn up the heat a bit and either say no, or maybe say, uh, instead of 18 months, you get a year. And there, that'd be the last year. So get off your duff or or else. Anyway, that's that's sort of where I sit on this. I think it's, uh, it, or otherwise we're just gonna get played over and over and over again. Thank you. Councilor Hazelton. <clears throat> so Derek, can I ask you a question here? Um, if, if we didn't approve this uh, and there is in fact a new owner who wants to do something, what would his path be? And that's sorry through the mayor to Councillor Hazelton. That was in the context if council did approve this. No, no. If if council does not approve it, and the current owner who's done nothing with it forever um, actually does sell it to somebody new, um, what is that new owner's path? Can he come back to us in six months and ask for an extension? So if this is if the extension's not approved, and ultimately that means by the district of Muskoka, because uh, what we're considering here today is a recommendation to the district. Right. Um, um, if the um, extension is not granted, um, and it is not appealed to the OLT by an owner then the approval does lapse and a new owner a new developer would have to reapply for plan a subdivision okay thank you the, the what costs does the owner have to bring these resolutions forward for um for this. extension for this yes uh it's it's a minimal application to the township it's in the neighborhood of seven or eight hundred um dollars to request an extension so not a big deal to request an extension. Okay, so uh, so I guess what I'm what I'm getting at is, um, I like well. First of all, I was very disappointed that it was going to be 18 months before we have a new OP and zoning bylaw, but that's uh, that's another <laughs> topic. <laughs> uh, but I understand your your comments about alignment there. Um, uh, given given the exposure I've had to this, a shorter renewal in my opinion, is better than a longer one. Um, I like, you know, 12 to 18 months, or sorry, 24 down to 18 months, that's better. What are the implications of 12 or six? I mean, put it, it put putting the guy on, on basically a notice that we're tired of the endless renewals and we're gonna start dropping the time frames down to 12 months or six months, and you either sell it and allow the new guy to, to go for a 24 month extension or whatever. Uh, am I thinking the wrong way here? Through the mayor to Councillor Hazelton and the rest of uh, council. Um, no, you're not thinking wrong at all. And I've certainly um, uh, in my past experience considered and recommended support of six month extension. So sometimes you have a developer who's who might come forward and say to council, look, I know I was here two years ago. You granted me a two year extension, but by the way, in the last two years, I've knocked off um, 37 of these 42 draft plan conditions. I'm almost there. I need another six months. Please grant it to me. So that's a common scenario. Um, in this case, I, I certainly understand and, and appreciate um, um, a potential desire from council to send a message. And um, certainly staff are in council's hands here if you want to. Um, request um, or recommend that the district um, grant an extension for a shorter period of time, 12 months, six months, whatever the case may be, you're certainly able to do so. Um, from my um, experience, seeing that um, very little progress has been made on the draft plan conditions over all these years, I would consider it unlikely, um, quite frankly, that a developer, even if they um, aggressively pursued clearing their conditions tomorrow would be able to wrap them up within six months. I think they're at a minimum a year away, just the way it works to be able to clear conditions. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if if council wishes to adjust the, the time frame. Yeah, I'm not focused on clearing conditions. I'm only focused on 
if in fact there is a new buyer, not uh, cutting off the potential for the project, but to let a new buyer come in and let him ask for time to complete the conditions, but not have, but basically allow a six month window for the guy or a 12 month window or something for the guy to close. Anyway, that's just thoughts. Councilor Jarvis. Yeah, I guess I'm, I misunderstood. I thought the, the, the district had recommended the uh, year and a half, but we, this is originating here. Um, but they're the ultimate authority on this. So, so what we decide here goes to district as a recommendation. Got it. Okay. Um, I'm hearing what's being said by other counselors. I, I get it. I think that we've got to get this guy to uh, do something or get off the pot. Um, I think, though, that allowing uh, that it takes time to get things rolling, uh, saying a year and a half versus two years is a good enough indication to him that we want things moving. So I'd be, I'm okay with the year and a half on this. Uh, for your recommendation uh, on that basis, and thank you, Councillor Predcom. This is taking a lot more than fifteen minutes, isn't it? This council well, talks too much. Not taking a year. To say, say, say no. Um, I was just going to be very quick and say that uh, yes, I think a shorter time period is effective. If the if the um, <clears throat> plan review and then the zoning bylaw review is going to take a year and a half, I don't think it makes sense to make it less than that time period because um, they would have to suddenly ask for another extension because and we wouldn't be able to know how to grant it because we would be in the midst of completing that review so um, i think this i think the, the message we're sending is that we hope you uh get going on this and this is our our uh, leash that we're providing with you and you might have different rules at the other end of this 18 months, so I would uh, encourage them to get going if that's what if that's what their intent is. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in as well and say that um, I think they've requested two years by recommending 18 months. We're absolutely sending that message, and whether we recommend six months or 12, I think we recommend six or 12 months. It'll be much easier for district to say townships are. Township doesn't know what they're talking about. They're talking through their hat because that's unrealistic, and therefore they might just go to 24 months to say that uh, you know, yeah, we we got the documents from township, but you know, let's be practical. I think the 18 months is a good. Let me call it compromise. We we have a rationale behind it is that we're hoping sometime in 2025 to approve an official plan, and certainly in 18 months, if it hasn't been approved by that point, we should. I'm hoping we'll be darn close to having it approved. Um, so I, I think that, um, I think what we're doing here is we're, we're very clearly sending a message to district that we're losing our patience. Um, dare I mention that, you know, we are in a country with a huge housing crisis. This plan that has been in an approved state for 15 years, has more modest homes in their plan than many of the homes that are we are approving normally. It's not waterfront. And some of these are multi-unit buildings or townhouses. Um, these are probably gonna be the more affordable, attainable homes in our neighborhood. Um, certainly more affordable or attainable than what we were looking at earlier today, given the location. And this is what we need. And and I think, you know, and we need them urgently. So I I I, I personally, while I, I think 18 months is in one hand generous, I think it's also those at the same time sending a message. Let's get on with it. Anyway, uh, Councillor Cooper, you had a, an additional comment? Well, uh, yes, I do. Um... I'm not going to get into the weeds here, uh, I, other than to say uh, we don't have much of an indication that the district is going to turn down what we are recommending. They generally uh, approve what we are expecting. However, if it's 18 months, fine. I just remind us all that I'll see you in 18 months, and I bet you we, we're going to be in the same spot. So I hope we aren't, but it looks like we probably will be. Thank you. 
I have moved by Councilor Cooper, seconded by Councilor Graziano, be it resolved that Township of Georgian Bay supports the extension of draft plan of subdivision approval for Port Severn Heights Phase 1, application S2007-04, for a maximum period of 18 months, and that the District of Muskoka, being the approval authority, be advised of the Township's recommendation. All those in favor? And that is carried unanimously. Moved by Councillor Jarvis, second by Councillor Hazelton. Be it resolved that the Township of Georgian Bay supports the extension of draft plan of subdivision for approval for Port Severn Heights Phase 2, application S2016-01, for a maximum period of 18 months, and that the District of Muskoka, being approval authority, be advised of the Township's recommendation. All those in favour? And that is carried unanimously. And... Moved by Councillor Predko, seconded by Councillor Jarvis, just because I looked at them first. Uh, and thirded by me. Be it resolved that Planning Council recesses at 1220 to reconvene on April 9th, 2024, following the Committee of the Whole. All those in favor. And we got we got a majority. So while you're thinking about it, Councillor Jarvis, everybody else has already voted that we're doing it. <laughs> So outvoted. you're outvoted. And so we're now breaking for lunch. We'll be back before one o'clock so we can start the one o'clock committee of the whole, which will include some guests. With the cow link. With a different link. So I guess we're delinking. We're de, de, de we're delinking now and relinking this afternoon.